Good morning and welcome to our continuing live coverage of King Charles III's journey around the United Kingdom. Today the King continues his tour visiting Northern Ireland. There he will acknowledge the tributes paid to his mother and attend a service of reflection for the life of Queen Elizabeth II. A busy day lies ahead for the new King. First this morning he'll fly into Northern Ireland's capital where he'll land at George Best Belfast City Airport. And it's there where the River Lagan meets Belfast Loch that he'll take his historic first steps in the country as King. It's in the shadow of the famous shipbuilding firm Harland & Wolfe's giant cranes Samson and Goliath that the official reception party awaits the King's touchdown. His Majesty will then travel to Royal Hillsborough, where members of the public lining the village's streets will get their first proper glimpse of the new king. There he'll have an audience with the new Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. He'll meet invited guests and receive a message of condolence, which will be delivered by the Speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly. Just after 20 past two, the king will leave Hillsborough Castle, making his way through Royal Hillsborough Village back to Northern Ireland's capital, Belfast. He's then expected in the city centre, travelling past Belfast City Hall around 20 minutes later. And shortly after that, the King will then arrive at Belfast Cathedral, known locally as St Anne's, for the service of reflection, marking the life of Queen Elizabeth II, which is due to begin at three o'clock. During the course of the day, I'll be welcoming a number of guests to share their thoughts and memories of the Queen. We'll discuss Her Majesty's relationship with Northern Ireland, as well as offering an insight into the man who was Prince and is now King. And joining me first are one of Northern Ireland's best-known broadcasters, Gloria Honeyford and Lord Bew, Paul Bew, Emeritus Professor of Politics at Queen's University Belfast, who was, as it happens, a student at Cambridge with the new king. We'll talk about that in a moment, but welcome to you both. It's lovely to have you with us today. Gloria, you are, of course, one of Northern Ireland's most familiar faces. You, in fact, lived in the village of, of Royal Hillsborough for, for many years. Yes. And you've had a number of encounters with the Queen. We'll talk about those in more detail. But what are your first thoughts about the place we find ourselves in today and the legacy left by Queen Elizabeth? Well, first of all, we had a family home in Hillsborough for 20 years. And so today is that mixture of sadness and yet excitement at the new king actually coming to the village. It's a Georgian village. It's uh, very intimate. It's very small. And the castle, of course, is not a traditional castle, but it's just a really, really wonderful, luxurious home. And uh, I would have passed it every day. Um, so the, my thoughts are, I mean, I'm in a, a kind of a state, not of denial. I know that the Queen has passed, but in a weird way, I've watched all the coverage of BBC for the last couple of days. And there's a, an element of me that sort of can't quite believe the fact that uh, she's gone. And I know that I've met lots of people who say the same thing because I loved her. I loved her from when I was a small girl and followed her life. I was fascinated by her as a princess. Uh, we didn't have television in our houses at that point. Uh, I, we saw Pathy News on a Saturday morning at the cinema, the pictures we called it on the Saturday. And I was like enthralled by the princesses and then enthralled when she stepped off the plane and she was queen. And so from that moment, you know, I have followed her wonderful reign. I admire her so much. I, I loved her work ethic. I loved the, her naturalness with people young and old, and we've seen lots of children the last couple of days who are fascinated by the Queen. And, uh, and I just have so much admiration for the way her knowledge was uh, worldwide. She travelled a lot, she knows people. And, uh, and I, I still can't get used to the thought that uh, two days before she passed, that she was smiling, albeit a little bit frail, but seeing one Prime Minister out, another one in. And I just, in my mind, couldn't take on board that she died two days later. I feel really sad. Paul. I think you will have your thoughts on how history will view the Queen and Northern Ireland, her relationship with Northern Ireland and indeed the Republic of Ireland and how she made history yep. in that uh, relationship. And we'll talk about that throughout the course of our conversation. But just for now, what's your personal reflection on, on the role that she played and the fact that she's no longer with us? Well, there isn't any question of the benign impact 
of the Queen on Northern Ireland and Ireland and Anglo-Irish relations, quite dramatically benign by the time it comes to 2011, 2012, in terms of transforming an era of irritable, angry feelings into something much more positive. And there is no, no doubt about that. There's a, a moment in 1967, on the eve of the Troubles, when she visits Belfast and a breeze block is thrown at the car. And interesting, the chap who did it wouldn't then uh, speak English and when the police came to him and said, you know, why'd you do this sort of thing? He said uh, he would only speak in Irish. Now, there's a virtuous circle in which the Queen then comes to Lump Castle and addresses the Irish president in, Ar in Irish. And she is the one speaking in Irish. And somehow that conveys the way in which she had that transformative effect uh, and, and was so widely respected both in the North and in the South and in both communities. As we saw yesterday in the very benign and, 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 and uh, cross-community tone of the assemblies, uh, debate in, 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 in Northern Ireland yesterday. So there really isn't any doubt about that. Um, there is an argument that uh, I can remember an Irish senior official saying to me, I don't believe Anglo, there's no limit to how good Anglo Irish relations can become after this. Now, we're actually in the aftermath of the Brexit and protocol rights in a slightly different situation. But there is no doubt that as we approach the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement, the greatest tribute to the late sovereign would be if those institutions were seen to work again. Um, Paul, for the benefit of people watching our, our programme today who don't know perhaps an awful lot about the intricacies of life in Northern Ireland, it is uh, often referred to as a place apart. The monarchy historically had a very different relationship with people in Northern Ireland yes. and the island of Ireland than, than Scotland, Wales and England. Um, how significant is that, do you think, on a day like today? Well. I've started, I mentioned the stark moment of 67 where I can think there's no question that um, the nationalist Republican community would view the event uh, of her visit with a degree of coolness, shall we say. Uh, and then you look at the, the, the assembly and how speakers from both traditions across the board speak in a very respectful way of, of, of Her Majesty. And I think there, there is that change. Uh, um, and it is a function to a very large degree of those key meetings, uh, um, which also, you know, it isn't just a matter of speaking in Irish. At all times, the unionist community has felt a, 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 a direct involvement and reassurance from the monarchy. I just take a simple thing the, the other day with Peter Robinson in the ceremony the other day. Peter Robinson's famous for saying in 1985, Northern Ireland is on the window ledge of the Union. There he is 35 years later, right at the centre of a key moment of ceremony of the British state. So it's been, a, the, the, the way the monarchy functions tends to reassure unionists and there's greater respect among nationalists than ever there was. Um, Peter Robinson, of course, former First Minister of Northern Ireland, um, leader of the DUP, which was the party established by, uh, by Ian Paisley. Just, um, I'm going to tempt you into the politics of this just a okay. little bit, Gloria. Did, did, did you see um, that transformative influence that the Queen had on the, on the politics of Ireland in the gestures that she made? Oh, definitely. And, and we've seen lots of footage over the last few days about, about when she went to Dublin, for example, you know, how people really greeted her with great admiration. I just have a theory of my own that mm. irrespective throughout the world in terms there is unrest in certain countries about the monarchy, etc. I just feel, in my heart anyway, that the Queen was sort of above all of that mm. and irrespective of the politics, etc., um, that she was just so admired and loved. Well, thank you both for now. During our coverage of today's events, we'll be looking at that unique connection the Queen had with Northern Ireland and teasing out some of the complexities of that relationship. We'll also hear more thoughts and recollections from people whose lives were touched by Her Majesty. But first, let's recall just some of the Queen's many visits to Northern Ireland. All it took was the familiar smile the wave and the ready handshake and she made every meeting special and in return she received special affection. But long before she became Queen, she was a regular visitor to Northern Ireland. The Royal Plain bringing the King and Queen and Princess Elizabeth on a visit to Ulster. And if this visit in 1945 was a chance for the people to see the young princess, 
It was a chance for the young princess to further her education. The visit to Parliament buildings gave Princess Elizabeth her first experience of any Parliament. The warmth of the reception she received from a gathering of 50,000 at Harland and Wolfe shipyard was to become a familiar experience. I name this ship Eagle. May God protect her and all who sail in her. And she captivated hearts again when, as Queen Elizabeth, she and the Duke of Edinburgh visited only weeks after she was crowned. Her charm and her smile disarmed all who met her, no matter their rank. The situation in Northern Ireland was such that security was tight on her Silver Jubilee tour. But there were garden parties at Hillsborough and a visit to the new University of Ulster. And she continued to carry out her sovereign's duties. Every visit was a chance for people to get close to her, sometimes a little too close. But she famously said she had to be seen by people in order to be believed. Always ready to make friends, she was equally ready to make history. Her visit to the Irish Republic, the first by a British monarch, was hugely symbolic. Over her lifetime, she witnessed enormous change in Northern Ireland. But what many here remember was her willingness to meet the challenge of this place with her ever open hand. An open hand and the smile that those who met her will never forget. That's a, a lovely moment where the Queen reaches for a helping hand out of the launch at Carrick Fergus Harbour. Some lovely memories for people there, Gloria. And in fact, lovely. it was as a as a young girl that you caught your first glimpse of the Queen. Uh, absolutely. So I would have been 13 and I was out on my bicycle on a country road. And I think I'm right in saying that Northern Ireland was the first official visit after uh, Her Majesty became the Queen. And you can imagine the excitement. However, I'm innocent enough at 13. And the police came along and pushed us sort of to the hedge to get out of the way with the bicycle, narrow road. And then, to my amazement, along came a glass top car with the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh in it, you know, presumably on their way to Hillsborough. And it was so incredible because, as I mentioned, very few people really had televisions. It only began to get them in our country until until the coronation. So I watched it at Mrs. McCracken's, which was a neighbour in our road, fascinated. And you saw her on that visit, that was 1953, but then subsequently, when you established yourself as a broadcaster, in fact, yes. you made a television documentary about that visit. Yes, I did. And I, You've I've probably been, seen more of the pictures than any of us. I, well, I've been very lucky uh, for various reasons, I've been around that long, <laughs> to actually um, come across the Queen on, on many different occasions. For example, the Royal Variety shows, you know, she didn't go to every one, but I was involved in nine of those. So over the years, she probably was at least four of them. So lots of photographs, you know, because after Afterwards. And I, I always loved it because no matter which royal cult, but th there she is. She talked to everybody backstage after the Royal Variety. Well, you can imagine as a kid from Northern Ireland, having really genuinely admired the, the Queen from being a princess, what a thrill that was. And the other thing that I really admired about the Queen is the fact that I liked her attitude of never explain you know, never complain or whatever way around that is. And because she was very private in that sense. And I liked that attitude. But yet when she was with people, very open and that fabulous smile. Yeah. And she was so pretty as a child and gorgeous to the very end, always dressed beautifully. And that smile, mm. even when she was meeting mm. the, the new uh, prime minister. Mm. Absolutely. What, what, what's interesting, yeah. Paul, is just looking at some of those pictures um, that 
Gloria was talking about there, back from the early days, 1953, yeah. that visit to Northern Ireland after her coronation. I mean, she had superstar status at that point. I mean, yep. her, her motorcade was was mobbed. The, yep. the crowds were 10, mm. 15, 20 deep wherever mm. she went. Yes, that's right. I mean, but you were alluding this to her earlier, alluding to this earlier, that the... the the bulk of that affection came from the unionist community. Um, what has changed over time and is dramatised by the speeches in the Assembly yesterday, the respect and warmth that there is on the other side uh, of the communal divide in Northern Ireland. And then, of course, Northern Ireland is changing, and I think you're going to find a new king today trying to dr address the, 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 the face which weren't present when Gloria and I were, 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 were uh, in, 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 in growing up in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, um, and so the monarchy now has a role of adapting to a new world in Northern Ireland where, where there's more diversity. But the fundamental achievement is that by the end, of this nobody could have imagined in the late 60s the tone of, of, of the of the addresses yesterday from across the board in Northern Ireland and, and, and that is that is really interesting again in case people just maybe haven't picked up on mm. some of the details we have uh, Sinn Féin's vice president and first minister in waiting Michelle O'Neill talking about the Queen yesterday as a courageous and gracious leader yeah um, and, and talking about her warmth kindness yeah. and unfailing courtesy towards us as as Republicans you you would never have imagined that a few short years ago. Exactly so, and you're going to see, I think, as events unfold today, that again being replayed out into the the, the, the former respect that Sinn Féin is willing to give. Inconceivable, uh, in, in the, I could certainly say with certainty in the late 60s. Um, you talked, Gloria, about the relationship that you had with her when you met her over over a number of times, quite a few times down the years. Um, you, of course, were presented with your OBE by the Queen, which must have been a particular thrill for you. And when you got your opportunity, you were determined not to let it pass too quickly. <laughs> well, <clears throat> as I've mentioned, I was in so much admiration of everything that she did. I mean, as a leader, all the things that mm. we've been saying. And it was such a thrill to get an OBE in the first place. Mm. Uh, but we didn't know who was going to present it. And when we heard in the palace that that it was to be the Queen that day, I was overexcited. So, as you can see there, when I shake hands with anybody, I have an inclination, shake my hand, Paul, I always do that. I put my <laughs> hand over the clasped hand. And my family, my, my husband and my two sons were sitting, and they were thinking, is she ever going to let the Queen's hand go? <laughs> but the thing is, she's so animated, you know, she was talking about all sorts of things, and because I've loved and admired her so much, I just held on as long as I could. But the papers told me the next day that I'd broken protocol. But the Queen did not complain. She did not. She didn't complain and I didn't have to explain to her either. And that was quite a personal conversation in fact you had with her Very, because occasion. it was for cancer services and she was asking about my daughter Karen. And she was really, she, I felt, and I've heard a lot of people over the last few days, she really seemed to lock into your eyes and it was a very deep conversation and she seemed to want to talk on so that hand of mine stayed there. Yeah. Um, I, just, I just think I can't find enough adjectives to describe um, just the way she dealt with everything, you know. I mean, you, you see the warmth of that person with children and with mm. older people. And you see, I think that everybody in Northern Ireland today, everybody, irrespective of their politics, will be actually very sad that she's passed, but also interested in what's going to happen. You see, I think, personally, that King Charles is going to be a good king because he's had a great teacher and he's been around with the Queen for a long time to actually pick up on everything and and I just think that his interests in the world and life are as vivid and as keen as the Queen's were. That's a very interesting point, Paul, isn't it, that Gloria makes. Uh, King Charles has had a very lengthy mm, apprenticeship perfect. as as Prince of Wales. So as Gloria says, he's had someone very impressive to, to learn the skills of statecraft from. We are looking back today at the legacy of Her Majesty the Queen, but we are also looking forward. Yep. Um, to what his reign might mean. I mean, what are your initial thoughts of what he might be like? Because this is someone you've known since the age of 18 well, or 19. Well, you were he, at Cambridge he, with him. He, he was, he, he was an uh, exact contemporary of mine. Uh, and um, I have an embarrassing incident rising that period, that, uh, but it was put back into my mind by when he talks about being a constitutional monarch yesterday. There were very celebrated lectures given by Edward Norman on modern British Irish modern British constitutional and political history. 
very wild, well attended. So that was an over, it was overcrowded. I was standing at the back one day. I'd got there a bit late. The lecture come, comes to the end. And I turn, I don't look, I step back slightly as the lecture ends. We're all standing up, not sitting down, or those of us who were late. And I trod on somebody's toe, and it was actually, I turned around and said, oh, I'm terribly sorry, it was Prince Charles. <laughs> and he, he just looks at us fine. He, he was obvious <laughs> it was an accident. Um, and I'm happy to say that sometime later, when Paul Murphy was Secretary of State, there was a small dinner in Hillsborough Castle, four people who were at Cambridge at the same time. And I'm glad to say, I came in prepared to apologise but I happily to say it was obviously a race for his memory and he just came up and started talking to me about exactly what you'd expect him to start talking and he, what he does have is a very deep concern knowledge of the history of Northern Ireland he came to the City Hall a year ago or so he's been there a lot hasn't oh, he? oh he's been there a lot but he came to the City Hall for the 20 he met all the historians on the committee I chaired for the commemoration a diverse group of the 100 years history of Northern Ireland and he sat and he listened asked very probing questions this is the person who who knows his constitutional history, knows his history. And um, if, if that matters, and I think it does, it's a good sign. Yeah, and we're going to be at Belfast City Hall later in our coverage. And the other lesson we learned from that story, Paul, is that uh, King Charles didn't bear a grudge. grudge. I think he totally <laughs> forgot it, thank heavens. <laughs> well, from her first days as a monarch, the Queen understood the importance of being seen by all her people, something she demonstrated during that first visit back in 1953. The Governor of Northern Ireland declared a public holiday for excited children. The day the Queen visited their town almost 70 years ago was a memory they'd never forget. There was tremendous passion and excitement. To take part and be part of this occasion was really, really important to us. The war was now past, and now it was time to, to enjoy yourself. The excitement was the fact that she was here in Belfast. I was thrilled. You know, I never thought, as a young woman, that I would actually see the Queen of England. It was two seconds, but you know, just those two seconds meant everything to the people who turned out to see her that day. And you know, there was cheering, there was clapping. I actually seen people, older people, standing beside me crying, because I think they never thought there would be a time when they would see the Queen of England either. I was in the Boys' Brigade going to Balmoral to see the Queen. I was smaller than some of the other boys. I was trying to get into a position where I could even get a better view of her. So everybody seemed to be of the same opinion. The one thing that fascinated me that she was so small and so petite. Well, the idea was that she would come by train from Belfast to Derry, and the first stop was Ballymena, and then they arrived in Ballymoney. A sea of Union Jacks, you would hardly see faces. The RAF band struck up the national anthem and we sang it, and the noise was tremendous. The whole thing was over in slightly over 10 minutes. As the train slowly moved out, the RAF band played the national anthem again and everybody sang it again. Royal Day was very, very important because it was just somebody we looked up to. The Queen was part of your family. I mean, she hung on the wall beside your mother's wedding photograph. I was a member of the 7th London Dairy Cathedral Brownies and uh, we were so excited. She just looked so radiant and so friendly. We were just hanging on to every second that she was slowly passing. Her legacy to me is that she showed commitment and she cared for the ordinary people on the street. She has definitely put the people first 
and her self second. She has been tremendously uh, devoted to Northern Ireland. On a number of occasions later on in life, when I met the Queen, that was very obvious that she had the interests of Northern Ireland at heart. Now, joining Gloria and Lord Bew, I'm pleased to say, is Lord Mandelson, who, as Peter Mandelson, was, of course, Secretary of State for Northern Ireland between October 1999 and January 2001. Pal uh, it's lovely to see you. Welcome. Lovely to be here. We haven't bumped into each other for quite a while. <laughs> uh, but I do remember one thing, Peter. You particularly loved your time at Hillsborough Castle. I did love it. And uh, I wasn't a sort of tourist Secretary of State coming from London making the odd visit. I lived there. And I lived during the weekends. And I invited people from all around Northern Ireland you know, to, to come in at weekends. and. Uh, and I went to stay with them. I mean, it was a period, I have to say, of great controversy because the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, having been made, then stalled. It didn't get implemented for over a year. And it stalled over the issue of decommissioning, and it was a very difficult one uh, to navigate our way through. So it was a controversial time. But for me, I have to say, my time in Northern Ireland was the period of most peace and calm uh, uh, during my ministerial career. I think it had something to do with being f the furthest away from London I could get. <laughs> <laughs> when you see the splendid uh, backdrop that we have today um, in, in all its summer glory, you feel as gardens, if you're back there. No, the garden's changed a bit. I mean, I think that I don't quite remember that, that beautiful, beautiful garden. I think that's been uh, 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 spruced up. But I loved the grounds uh, very much. There was a particular... Um, fenced off as a lovely rose garden. I'm afraid I can't remember what it was called. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, before the light went down, I would sometimes just go in there <laughs> and yeah. reflect the and lady, inhale the scent. The Lady Granville? Lady Granville, that's garden. right. Isn't and that the right? lake, of course. Yeah. And the lake. The lake's beautiful. Well, the lake had a special significance for me because um, my golden retriever, Bobby, loved the lake. <laughs> So he, 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 uh, he, I could hardly get him out of it. But the carpets, the carpets <laughs> and the furniture didn't like that uh, <laughs> when he came back. <laughs> the, the, the carpet suffered a little bit. But, um... And what, what, what's interesting is that the way in which the, the, the house, as Gloria says, it's not really a castle, it's a lovely big house, yeah. has now been opened up to the public yes. formally. I'm so pleased. Uh, since you were there. But, but Mo Molum, who was your predecessor, and, and you and others, have tried to make it more accessible to ordinary people than yes. perhaps it was in the past. When it was, of course, the governor's residence, and the governor was married to an aunt of the Queen. So yeah. the Queen was visiting, at an early stage in her life, yeah. her aunt and uncle, in fact, at Hillsborough Castle, which is a thing I think a lot of people perhaps forget about. Yes. Well, it was the Queen's house. And, you know, there was a lovely Queen's bed there, and Queen's bedroom. I mean, there was everything uh, there for her. She just sort of slotted into it whenever she came. And she was clearly very relaxed there. Mm. And do, I mean, just very quickly, what's interesting is that it was the Secretary of State's residence. It was a royal residence. Yeah. It's now open to the public. But it also was a location where serious high politics was played out. Uh, serious high politics. Look, the entire, well, not the entire, but almost, I mean, a huge amount of the negotiation that went into the Belfast Good Friday Agreement took place at Hillsborough. Mm. I mean, it was a, not least because there were all sorts of rooms where you could just sort of go off and hide and take people, this group or that party or this person or that individual, uh, and you could just have lots and lots of side discussions. And they were dotted all over the uh, uh, house uh, as sort of waves of sort of sandwiches and other bits and <laughs> pieces of food would sort of come out and sustain everyone. Uh, not a great deal of alcohol, I don't think. Uh, certainly not during the negotiations. But really? Sort of acres of sandwiches is what I associate with. <laughs> I'm very glad, actually, the public does have access um, to the castle now. Because in my time of living there, unless you were invited in for a function, you couldn't go into the castle. But uh, a short time back, uh, a couple of years maybe, I headed up a, a trust 
to raise money to make it accessible, you know, car parks and, and just laying it out properly. Yeah. And the gardens are so magnificent yeah. that I think it's terrific now that the people from Northern Ireland, and, and particularly after the significance of today, will be able to go there yeah. and see so part nice. of it. And so I, I'm really pleased that that's been opened. Yeah. And see the topiary, I gather, Peter, of um, your two dogs. Well, apparently there is. I'm told this, but I've, I've never Nobody's seen Nobody's actually told you before. <laughs> I've never You've not seen them? I've not actually seen them, but the dogs did become quite famous. Uh, uh, first Bobby and then Jack. I have to say, probably more popular during times of my, you know, duration as Secretary of State than me. Um, but I remember a wonderful incident of uh, Bobby when the Queen came uh, to present the George Cross to the RUC, which I had proposed as a way of respecting the RUC, which was being transformed into the police service of Northern Ireland, and I wanted to find a way of honouring their sacrifice, which had been huge. So the Queen did this, and we had a lunch, and before she was leaving, I wanted her to meet and say goodbye to all the staff who worked in Hillsborough. So I got them all lined up, at which point the kitchen door opened and out shot Bobby, who went shot straight through the lady's legs, sat there in the receiving line. The Queen was completely delighted. She put her hand out to pat uh, Bobby, uh, who promptly licked her hand <laughs> in a terrible breach of uh, uh, protocol. <laughs> much worse but, than Gloria's oh, much, much worse. worse. <laughs> I mean, much worse. Um, but, you know, but I do remember that day. You know, it, it, it was sur what we were doing in presenting the George Cross, again, was not without controversy uh, for many in, the, in Northern Ireland, but I felt it was a, the right thing uh, to do. But somehow the Queen is, has this ability, she had this ability to diffuse tension okay. we'll and talk. to calm. More about that in due course. It's lovely to have you with us Thank you. today. And today, the new king will use the airport many of us get first sight of when touching down in Northern Ireland's capital, George Best Belfast City Airport. That's situated just a few minutes' drive away from the city centre. His Majesty's flight from Edinburgh should land there in just under 10 minutes. The aircraft carrying the King will land on the single runway at the airport before taxiing to the Victoria apron, stand 24, some distance away from the main terminal building. And after disembarking, the King will be received by a number of invited guests, including the Lord Lieutenant of the County Borough of Belfast and the Secretary of State. So we will keep a watching brief on the airport and as soon as there's any movement we will of course bring it to you. I think it's a slight delay on the arrival of the King's flight but for many people today is about catching a glimpse of the new King on his first visit but it's also an opportunity to reflect as we've been saying on the life of the Queen. Our cameras have travelled across the country to capture some of the people of Northern Ireland's memories of Her Majesty. She was a lovely lady and she just was this was our queen, well, the only queen we ever knew. All my life I have known the queen and she's always been there. I've always looked up to her, just broken hearted that she has gone. She put duty above all and um, service to the country and to the people above everything and uh, not many people will be working until their 96th year so I think she was just a remarkable woman and we're all very saddened by her death. When I stayed with my grandfather back in the 60s, they used to play the Queen last thing at night before the TV went off. And I says, what's all this about? You know, when you're young, you don't know any better. But uh, that's my first memory. She means a lot. I'm from the Republic of Ireland, from Dublin. I've been living here 30 odd years. Um, her visit to the Republic um, in 2011 was seismic in terms of the relationships between both our islands and trying to build a, a new way forward. I spent my whole life singing God Save the Queen. <laughs> it's not going to be easy to change, you know. They were celebrating the coronation. Me as a eight-year-old, it, it was special. There was flags everywhere and music. And my mother bought this mug. And I thought, what did you buy that for? <laughs> and when we came home, she said, that mug's for you. You'll have that mug when you're not of me. 
So it really has become very special to me, you know. She had a time for everybody, young and old, rich and poor. She was a wonderful lady. Well, the new king is expected to arrive in Belfast shortly. Northern Ireland is, of course, no stranger to King Charles. His first trip to the country took place at the beginning of the 1960s when he was just 12 years old. And he's made many frequent visits ever since. Today's journey will, however, be very different. It would be hard for anyone coming five days after the death of their mother. But today the king also bears the responsibility of coming to Northern Ireland for the very first time as monarch. Uh, Paul, do you think that will be weighing heavily on the King's mind as he approaches Belfast oh, City I, I, Airport? I'm absolutely certain, uh, and I'm absolutely certain one of the key themes today will be to respect the new Belfast, the new Northern Ireland, and the place it has been changing from when you know, we talked about the 1960s earlier, in lots of ways, the demographic changes, the new communities, Chinese community, very important now in Belfast, one of the oldest communities, the Jewish community, uh, um, you know, you can expect to find, the king has always had an idea, he wanted to be, uh, 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 you know, to, to respect all faiths, and I think you're going to find an outreach, to, not just to the two main communities in Northern Ireland, but the entire community, and it's now a very different place, even a different place from the time that, that Peter was Secretary of State. Yeah, we just saw a picture there of what we believe was the, the King's plane from our cameras in Hillsborough. Uh, we think he's going to be arriving within the next five minutes or thereabouts. Peter, I don't know how much contact you've had with um, the now King Charles through the years, but he, as we were saying just before you joined us, he's had a long apprenticeship. He has uh, studied at the knee of his mother for this uh, very daunting role which he takes on. Uh, do you think we will see a huge difference in the way in which the monarchy engages with the people, particularly in a place like Northern Ireland, or do you think it will effectively be business as usual? I, I think that his relationship with the public uh, will be strong. Uh, he is a very outward going person. He loves meeting people. He has a very inquiring mind. He likes to inform himself about uh, people's lives and the conditions in which they live. And he spent his entire life as Prince of Wales trying to do something about those conditions. He's always sought to improve the lot of young people, of young black people, of people who have housing problems, who have live in troubled inner city areas, the environment. Now, as we know, he's made very clear, you know, he's not going to be an activist king. No. Uh, and that's quite right. Oh, because he can't but be. He can't be. No. But, uh, but all this will, his experience as, as Prince of Wales, will inform his outlook. Uh, as king, and I suspect very strongly that he'll pass on a lot of his previous role uh, to the new Prince of Wales. And when you look at some of the um, things that he's engaged with down the years, very difficult things, you can see that he stretched himself as well. I mean, he shook hands, for example, with Gerry Adams in Galway mm. in 2015, and the Sinn Féin president had publicly justified the IRA's murder of the mm. King's great uncle, Lord Mountbatten, to back in 1979. Was, to very he close. was very, very of close. Course. So you can imagine and then two, two years later, mm. when they met again, he shook hands and he told uh, Gerry Adams, he paid his condolences on the death of Martin McGuinness and told um, uh, Gerry Adams that he'd written a letter to Mr McGuinness's widow. And it's quite interesting. He also, we gather, wrote yeah. a letter to, to Mary Lou Macdonald when she had COVID. Yeah. So this is the person who's prepared to stretch himself. He's forward-looking as well. He, I mean, he, that he, is forward-looking. Look, he's he he he's a man of tradition, of the principles of kingship, but he's also a very adaptable uh, individual. You'll we'll find him very forward-looking, uh, and I think that's okay. going to be one of the main characteristics of his reign. Well, we'll pick up on some of those uh, points in a moment or two, but uh, for the moment, let's just turn our attention to George Best Belfast City Airport, where we can see the King's aircraft approaching. It's just touching down. It will pull onto the airport's Victoria apron in just a few moments to allow its passengers to disembark. And among those awaiting His Majesty's arrival 
are the Lord Lieutenant of the County Borough of Belfast, Dame Fanula J. O'Boyle, who's a personal friend of the King's, and we'll be hearing from her a little later in our coverage. Um, also there, to greet him, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, the Right Honourable Chris Heaton Harris MP, and he's been in that role for a week today, so it's a big day for him. And then Matthew Hall, Chief Executive at George Best Belfast City Airport, is also in the welcoming party. And it's also a very special morning to, for two children from Forge Integrated Primary School in Belfast, Lucas will present the King with a gift of a tin featuring an image of the Giant's Causeway, which contains um, some very delicious truffles made by a company in Castle Rock, I gather. And Ella will present the Queen Consort with a small posy of flowers picked from Hillsborough Castle. And we'll see them later. Do you know what in I'm delighted process. about? It's not raining. Well, because sometimes when you land yes. at Belfast Airport, at the city airport, you have to walk in the rain. <laughs> yeah, well, the sun is shining and I yeah, think it's quite, great. quite mild in <laughs> Belfast today. So um, we couldn't have done better than we have done as far as the weather is concerned. You're quite right, Gloria. Now, in the process, um, those two young people I just mentioned will be two of the first people, of course, to welcome the royal couple to Northern Ireland as king and queen consort. So the plane will take a moment or two just to, to taxi into its stand. Uh, short enough hop, of course, over from, from Edinburgh. Um, it's worth making the point, of course, Gloria, that today is a very busy day for the King. And there are some very formal, important moments that he has to go through. Uh, the message of condolence inside Hillsborough Castle and then the service of remembrance for his um, mother, Queen Elizabeth II, in Belfast Cathedral later. But he's had a series of incredibly busy days. A he, full day yesterday, of course, in Scotland. Yes, and actually, to go back just briefly to his proclamation, I mean, I thought it was palpable that day, um, A, what he said from an official point of view, but the feelings about his mother, you, you knew the relationship with Her Majesty was incredible. And last year, I did an interview with the Queen Consort um, about osteoporosis, because she's patron of that. And she also was very passionate about a lot of um, issues and charities and things. And once again, she, she came across to me anyway as being very affable and, uh, and very passionate because her mum and her grandmother had died from osteoporosis. So I think she has a lot to add in terms of her passion for what she believes in. Yeah, and she's traveling with him, of course, um, today as well. So it's a, it's a big day for her and it's her first time in Northern Ireland in her new role, although, of course, Paul, she's, she's been in Northern Ireland many times uh, in the past. They've, they've visited together as a couple yes. many times. Uh, and of course they've enjoyed visiting the Republic of Ireland together yep. as well. Exactly so. Um, so the plane is, is taxiing now to um, the Victoria Apron, Stand 24 as I say. It is a little distance, understandably, from the main terminal building, but hopefully in a moment or two it will come uh, to a halt and the steps will come down and the King and Queen Consort will emerge. And we should catch sight of that welcoming party very soon as well. And um, it's a big day for them. Peter, you've, you've found yourself in this position before in the lineup waiting to greet people as they step out of cars or off planes. And you just hope that everything yeah, I, goes I, according to plan? Yeah, I hope I became quite good at it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I remember President Clinton uh, uh, came um, uh, that was a very, very memorable uh, visit. I mean, he played a, a big part in the negotiations surrounding uh, the peace agreement. Uh, but then he came back to bid farewell at the end of his presidency. And uh, I remember that uh, uh, very well. He had such a strong commitment uh, to the peace agreement. Uh, and of course, the United States has always been a sort of a constant constructive pressure to bring. Uh, people uh, together uh, and I suspect that that will continue uh, uh, under President uh, uh, Biden. Um, I, I wish the administration there in the United States, I wish they had appointed a, a, an envoy for Northern Ireland. They've always had that before, somebody who was familiar with the views and tensions and pressures that exist on both sides yeah. of the community. And it's interesting that um, given President Biden's Irish ancestry that he's chosen not to do that. Uh, but yeah. he is, of course, coming to the state funeral for Her Majesty the Queen on Monday. 
uh, in London. Um, looks like preparations for the disembarkation are well advanced. Um, there's uh, Dame Fanula J. O'Boyle, the Lord Lieutenant of the County Borough of Belfast, just taking up her position at the bottom of the steps, and she will be welcoming the King and the Queen Consort as they step onto the tarmac, and alongside her, the Right Honourable Chris Heaton Harris MP and Matthew Hall, the Chief Executive at uh, City Airport. And a big day, we should spare a thought as well for uh, Lucas and Ella from uh, Forge Integrated Primary School, which is a, a school which draws children from, from all communities. Um, the integrated education movement is uh, a significant one in Northern Ireland. Just going to say that was a real landmark, wasn't it? When you started to have integrated education. I remember that clearly. It's nice that, um, that they've chosen those two children to be a part of today. I can imagine that um, they'll be feeling quite nervous, I would, ima <laughs> I would imagine, at the moment. Um, what a photograph to have for the rest of your life. Mm. But they'll immediately be put at their ease. You know, the yeah. King and the Queen Consort are just so good at calming, a, um, a light word, a light exchange, a little joke. That, that's what they're so good at. Members of the entourage, and that uh, is King Charles taking his uh, first steps onto Northern Ireland soil in his new role as monarch, greeted warmly by Dame Fanula J. O'Boyle. And they are, as I say, um, close friends. They've developed a very uh, close friendship over many years, both of them interested in uh, architecture, both of them interested in music. Dame Fanula is a, a trained singer. And that's Chris, Chris Heaton Harris, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, welcoming the King. That's uh, quite an engagement to be doing seven days into the job. And then we have Matthew Hall, Chief Executive of George Best Belfast City Airport, also welcoming the King. And you can see Dame Finula welcoming Camilla, the Queen Consort. Is now shaking hands with the Secretary of State, and the children get their moment. Gloria, this is lovely. What a moment. This is young Ella. My and goodness. what a, a, a lovely posy of flowers from the gardens at Hillsborough. And her parents would be so thrilled at this precise second. Yeah, right you can imagine. And, and then Prince Charles is, uh, he seems pleased with his tin of truffles <laughs> from Castle Rock. <laughs> Those will just slip neatly into his pocket. and. Uh, he Lucas and Ella did a very can, nice job. He can eat those to sustain himself during the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. I mean, very, very often, top, of course, top schedule. Yeah, very often, Peter, he, they, they receive gifts and hand them over to members of their entourage. But I see the Queen Consort and uh, the King are holding on to the flowers <laughs> yeah. and the truffles. Yeah. And they're just getting organised to step into the car. In the castle, by the way, they do have tins of biscuits sitting around in the main drawing room. So I don't think they're going to be hungry. Oh, good. <laughs> and you can see the royal standard on the uh, front of the car. And, uh, and again, Peter, that's the first time that Prince Charles will have traveled in a car in Northern Ireland with the Royal Standard um, yes. upon it. So, But it is his 40th visit. It I is. Gather. His 40th visit <laughs> to is, 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 today. It, it is so, indeed. But uh, first, first, but the first one as sovereign. As yeah. 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 So he's um, safely in the back of the car and it pulls out from the apron where the plane landed and it will make its way onto the motorway and it'll then travel out to Royal Hillsborough. So he's uh, set off on his royal progress almost 80 years after his mother first set foot in Northern Ireland. When the young Princess Elizabeth arrived then with her parents as part of a victory tour following VE Day, it was a very different world. The cars and drivers were supplied by Melville and Company Limited Belfast, funeral furnishers, motor car and ambulance hire service <laughs> and carting <laughs> contractors. And the bill, would you believe, came to £78, <coughs> 3 shillings and 9 pence. I think the bill for today will be considerably more than that. Um, and today the King's Entourage will travel through the outskirts of Belfast whose street names are testament to the fact that this was, of course, once a city of the empire. Victoria Street, Queen's Quay, Albert Square, and more recently, Queen Elizabeth II Bridge. Their destination, 
as we've said, Royal Hillsborough, where the princess spent her first night in Northern Ireland on her visit in 1945, and which today is a village well known to her son. The new king has stayed at Hillsborough Castle numerous times over the years. Today it will once again play a central role in proceedings as it has for the last few days. It was there on Sunday that the National Proclamation was read by Robert Noel, the Noroy and Ulster King of Arms, in front of assembled guests. Today, Hillsborough Castle is where a message of condolence by the Speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly will be delivered and where we'll hear His Majesty's first address as King in Northern Ireland. That will be uh, at around 20 past uh, 12 that he will arrive in Royal Hillsborough for the first time as King Charles III and probably slightly later than that now because he's running just a little bit late but somewhere close at hand to tell us more is my colleague Mark Simpson. This is the home from home for the royal family in Northern Ireland, Hillsborough Castle. King Charles knows it well. He's been here many times, though never before, as monarch. In fact, his first visit here was more than 60 years ago, way back in August 1961. He came with his mother, his father and his sister, Princess Anne, and they stayed here for two nights. Nowadays, there's a real community feel to Hillsborough Castle. You heard Gloria Honeyford talking about it earlier. In recent years, the grounds have been open to the public and it is very much a castle at the heart of a community. Just across the road from me, there's a bus stop. There's a pub, and I think what we're going to see when the monarch arrives here within the next 20, 25 minutes or so is a kind of mix of the informal outside when he may meet well-wishers, and there are thousands of them, and then the formalities of inside. Politicians are waiting here to meet the new monarch and the queen consort, Camilla. They will have a meeting, they will talk, and it will be politicians from right across the divide in Belfast, unionists on the one hand, nationalists and republicans on the other hand as well. And we do expect in the next half hour or so, or maybe within the next hour, to hear the first words from King Charles III on Northern Irish soil. As we know, People across the board in Northern Ireland, they love their history. We're going to see a little bit of history here shortly. Well, Royal Hillsborough is uh, a village I know fairly well, in fact. And Mark's quite right about the bus stop being near the King's front door, by the way. In fact, uh, a former colleague of mine, and Gloria will know him too, who lives on the square, tells a story about being startled when he realised the person waving at him from a passing car was Her Majesty the Queen, and uh, he was in his dressing gown putting out the milk bottles. <laughs> That's the kind of village Does that ring is, true? Though. Yes, very true. <laughs> so how has this small Georgian settlement come to figure so prominently in major affairs of state and politics? The answer dates back more than 350 years. From the top of Main Street, the hills of Belfast are clearly visible. It's a view that has been shared by queens and kings, presidents and prime ministers. The old coach road from Dublin winds through the village, and in 1650, in order to protect it, Sir Arthur Hill built a fort that was recognised in a royal charter from Charles II. Hence, Hillsborough. But it was the fine house that stands just off the square that was to place the village at the centre of British and Irish affairs. After the partition of Ireland in 1921, it became the home of the first governor of Northern Ireland. With its distinctive character, Hillsborough was separate from, yet close to, the economic and political heart of Belfast. And it was here that the young Princess Elizabeth holidayed with her aunt, Lady Rose, sister of Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, and her uncle, Earl Granville, Governor of Northern Ireland. So Hillsborough Castle became a home for the royal family. And the Queen stayed here many times during her long reign. Today, it is her son who visited so often as Prince 
who is welcomed back as king by the people of Royal Hillsborough. Well, with me still three people who know Royal Hillsborough and Hillsborough Castle in particular very well indeed. Uh, Gloria Honeyford, Lord Bew and Lord Mandelson. Uh, I mean, we said, Gloria, the weather's absolutely beautiful. You lived in the village. You, does it make you feel slightly homesick looking at those said, glorious I, pictures today? I've just said to Paul beside <laughs> me, my, my tummy's got butterflies because I know every house, every building in the village. And I think that that the king will be interested in the architecture because on the outskirts of Hillsborough now, they have built the most marvellous... Uh, I'm not quite, it's not really an estate, but every single house is different, mm. different kind of architecture. It was the most wonderful thing that I've seen in a long time. It's, a, it's such a pretty village and it's so, just so friendly and so affable. It's wonderful. Well, maybe I'll be controversial here and I'll be uh, criticised for this, Peter, but I think many people would feel that Royal Hillsborough would win the accolade for prettiest village in Northern Ireland. There'd be a few decent contenders, but it would be hard to, <laughs> hard to beat Royal Hillsborough, wouldn't it? Well, especially today, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel nostalgic looking at those pictures? I felt very nostalgic. I, I loved wandering around, uh, never, never by myself, or always protected. But th there, was, uh, th there were times I remember when I was doing things which perhaps were not so popular or, you know, and people would sort of give a little bit of a glare or a little bit of a sort of disapproving uh, look. But... Uh, I felt embraced uh, uh, there. I'm just seeing the pictures now. Mm. Uh, just some pictures of the, of the Queen in Hillsborough uh, Castle. And it's interesting t to see her meeting people because lots of events happened there. Duke of Edinburgh yeah. presentations were made. There were, of course, the annual oh, garden yeah. parties. Garden parties were very, very important. Um, I remember a garden party uh, whilst I was Secretary of State and the then Prince of Wales uh, came. And the night before, somebody had assembled a ladder and thrown an explosive device over the security perimeter, over the wall, and there was a great sort of fuss, should we cancel it? Absolutely not, was the Prince of Wales's view. He's going ahead, he's not going to have people disappointed. And so we went ahead, and uh, he just charmed everyone. And I remember one lady in particular, she was the widow of an RUC officer who'd been killed. And, I mean, he was going his way, I was going my way, and I met her, and she still had this sort of look of grief on her face. And I said, look, why don't you come and meet the Prince of Wales? Why don't you just say hello? She said, oh, no, no, I'm far too shy to do that. I don't want to do that. I said, come on. I put my arm around her, I took her up to the Prince, explained. And he was with her for five, six, seven minutes. And she was so pleased it made all the difference in the world to her. And for a man who sometimes people sort of present as being slightly stiff or aloof, mm. the, the, the truth could not be uh, more different. Mm. You know, he is a very warm person in, indeed and always finds the right words to, uh, for whoever he's with. Helped, of course, Paul, by the fact that Hillsborough Castle is such a pleasant space to, yeah. to entertain in. And um, you were talking about the dinner you were invited to by the then Secretary of State, Paul Murphy, which brought together um, former Cambridge yes, students and the Prince was there. I mean, we, we saw a, a glimpse of, of the interior of, of yes, the house yeah. there. And we'll, we'll be showing live pictures of that a little bit later as well. It's very comfortable. And um, I, I took a public tour mm. uh, uh, last year. Mm. And very, very impressive indeed. It's got a remarkable art collection, apart from anything else. Yes, the art collection. A lot of work's been done to read. His paintings are being neglected. And people like, I think, Christopher Worley Lack, you may be talking to later. Yeah. We're just it, about to hear from him. He, he did a great job in, in, in recovering and just transforming the visage of, of the whole place. But the what you'll see if you go in, of course, is many of the great photographs of key moments in the peace process. And it is, it is, it was the front of Hillsborough where Tony Blair said at the beginning of the last week of talks, he felt the hand of history on his shoulders. Mm. And there were a whole number of key other events that were held there, many of which involved Lord Mandelson. And, th and this is quite remarkable. This is, a, this is a picture on public view in Hillsborough, Peter, of a former yeah. IRA commander. Yes, Martin McGuinness. Mm. Um, could, could you I, have envisaged I, when you were Secretary of State he, all he those years a, ago that there would ever be a portrait <laughs> of Martin McGuinness on the walls? He was a formidable foe, mm. but also a formidable peacemaker. Uh, so it's quite right that his portrait is there. I mean, he contributed 
a huge amount. I mean, I found him variously both a bully and a charmer. <laughs> he was capable of both. Uh, I might say. People, do you think people um, will be surprised to, to, I, to, to discover <laughs> that that's actually on display in the castle? They may do, but it just is a reflection of... Of what, the journey. ..what's changed, how much has been achieved, the new Northern Ireland that has been created, in which we've got to bend every single sinew in our bodies to sustain. And it's going through a period of political difficulty uh, at the moment, uh, because there's disagreement over the post-Brexit arrangements and the trade arrangements and customs and, uh, and everything. Uh, I mean, I always thought that when the treaty was made, the Northern Ireland Protocol determining it would be difficult uh, to apply, but it can be applied sensitively. It just needs a little bit more flex on both sides. Mm. Uh, Martin McGuinness, of course, died in 2017. He was the Sinn Féin deputy First Minister and served uh, alongside Ian Paisley, yep. uh, Paul, they were famously known as the Chuckle Brothers. Uh, were, again, yeah. a relationship yeah. that people would never have imagined uh, a few years beforehand, but they became firm friends. They worked together very well. And um, you know, Martin McGuinness w was, was very quick to sympathise publicly with Ian Paisley's wife mm. whenever the former DUP leader died and we know that there was an exchange, a family exchange, whenever mm. Martin McGuinness then subsequently died. And Ian Paisley Jr. was very supportive of Martin McGuinness on That's his true. death as well. That's completely true. Funny enough, when I'm thinking of Hillsborough, I can think of one small unconsidered incident um, which plays a role in bringing about this better history. Um, in that first week, there's a moment, the politicians are milling around at the front of Hillsborough and the cameras are on and David Lord Trimble uh, recently uh, died. Uh, he, as he walked by, and the cameras were on it, as he walked by, he stopped for a minute to talk to Adamson McGuinness. Mm. And people hadn't seen that. And that's the kind of, it was just a kind of crowd scene. It was just a few minutes chat about something or other. And I, I was well aware that David talked to Martin and, and, uh, before. But it was the first shot at Hillsborough. And, and when I got home that night, people said, did you see that? And for example, there actually was quite a positive reaction in the nationalist community of surprise mm. that he'd stopped just to have a few words, just in the, in the courtyard there. Just an apparently trivial incident, but in one way, one of the seeds for the better Northern Ireland that came into being. Mm. Actually, you would know more about this than me, but any time I go to Northern Ireland, the one thing that I'm really conscious of is that young people in particular want to move on. You know, they hated the 30-odd years, etc., etc. I don't know what well, you, you live some, there. So. Clearly, some people do. You might say most people do, but there are perhaps some who don't. Yeah, but, but I, I think, think the other thing that's very interesting is that there, there, you know, there are a lot of young people who don't remember what it used to be like, yeah. and uh, they, they don't remember the dark days of the, of the Troubles. But Mark, That's... there's another point here. There's a huge economic potential for Northern Ireland, which we're already starting to see uh, emerge. You know, in a sense, they're having the best of both worlds, access to the European market, access to uh, Britain's market. Uh, if only we can get the trade arrangements uh, right, I honestly think Northern Ireland economically is really going to flourish, and that gives me tremendous... Uh, joy and uh, and hope for the future of the place. I think the King's arrival in Royal Hillsborough is imminent. He's been travelling in his uh, motorcade from George Best Belfast City Airport to Royal Hillsborough, which is a journey of, what, about 12, 12 13 miles, something like that, 25 it's minutes? It's about 10 minutes to go from yeah, Lisbon. Yeah. So, so um, and you'd imagine um, he's not going to have big difficulties with uh, the traffic because the road will have been cleared. We're just looking at, uh, at a shot there from one of our cameras at the end of the village and hopefully we'll pick up the royal entourage um, very shortly. And we can talk you through that as he makes his way uh, into the village and then up the main street and then uh, we gather that he's going to talk to members of the public who are waiting outside and we saw some pictures of, uh, of people who are waiting patiently for the, the royal arrival. I think actually, Gloria, we're looking at some of those new houses that you were talking about which have been built just actually, at the end. Actually, a lot of, of new uh, houses actually on the, the outskirts. Village. The one that I'm yeah. talking about is actually very close to the village, mm. but I was fascinated by it because architecturally each house is different. So I think Pins Charles so may get it. Gloria, you think the King would approve of the architecture, do you? 
I think he might actually. I'm quite it, impressed it, by it. <laughs> it's certainly been very sympathetically done. <laughs> yeah, that's yes, fair to say. No, very um, good. But the, the, the centre of the village, um, which is Georgian, it, it's really untouched, isn't it, for, oh, yeah. for, for, for generations? We're just looking Absolutely. at pictures now. That's, you know, uh, that's the square, which you can see is, uh, is very busy and uh, formal uh, guard of honour waiting. Um, that's, uh, uh, that's the gun salute uh, ready for when the Queen and Queen Consort enter the building by the state entrance. And there's a little area here, um, Peter, where um, VIPs can come up to the gates of the castle. Uh, mere mortals don't get too close to it, in fact, with their, with their car. Um, but obviously provision has been made for members of the public to get very close today. Mm. And so the, 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 the King and Queen Consort will have an opportunity to step out of the car and, uh, and meet people who've made the effort to be there for them today, presuming there's yeah. time for him to do that. Yeah, yeah. you can see that area the, immediately in front of the uh, castle yes. where we're, people are kept. And we're just looking at a, at a helicopter shot there of the, uh, yeah. of the royal motorcade making its way up the motorway. So we think he's very close to Hillsborough now. He'll turn off the main, uh, be the main road to Dublin um, yeah. for Hillsborough. And Look do at you, do you recognise this, uh, Gloria, at all? I do. You recognise? I'm very happy to be here, by the way, but I'd also love to be at that barrier. <laughs> I'd like to be... You'd like to be there, would you? I, w I would. I'd, I would love to just see some of our old neighbours and friends and see the excitement. And I know that it would be an amazing day for Hillsborough and beyond. Mm. Um, lots of children there as well, little brownies, uh, Cub Scouts, guides um, waiting in line i suppose uh, it's a day off school for them and uh, it's something as, as i think you said gloria something that they'll be able to tell their their children and perhaps their grandchildren about uh, just as you've been reflecting on 1953 for yes, us yes exactly yeah. also i mean there have been crowds in london where people have brought their children and the child might be a year old but the mother will say i will tell them eventually yeah. so there we see some movement some police outriders so uh, those waiting on the village's streets won't have much longer to wait. Uh, we can see there the royal entourage uh, approaching, certainly the, the outriders. Um, the king's about to arrive in Royal Hillsborough for the first time in his new role as monarch. Lots of police outriders. We should, should hopefully see a, a shot of the car coming into the bottom end of the village very shortly. They'll be coming in on, uh, on Lisburn Street and then they'll make their way up Main Street. So there we have them. Cars making their uh, way along Lisburn Street just at the moment and as they pass the junction with Culcavy Road, the dark stone wall you'll see surrounding the grounds of Hillsborough Castle begins. And Peter will know the pub that's coming up on the right. <laughs> because the estate, in fact, the, is very large. The park is huge. Yeah. Yes, it is. Um, so and, and, to... and, and secure. Uh, well, it's was, a very big high wall. It's a very big high wall, and it's, uh, the cameras are all, all the way around, but it just gave everyone an enormous sense of, sort of freedom when they were in those uh, grounds. Many was the time I would walk around with Jerry Adams or Martin McGuinness uh, or David Trimble. Uh, trying to sort of tease things out and find a way uh, forward. Uh, walking around those grounds was always a sort of yes. a balm <laughs> for whatever thing, problems yeah. we were experiencing yes. at the, the time. The other thing to say is that the house itself or the castle is, is warm. It's warm in its furnishings, it's wraparound, it's inviting. There's nothing at all austere about it. Mm. I mean, it is a home. It's interesting, just progress is slow here, and I suppose the reason for that very simply is a lot of people have turned out and the motorcade is, is deliberately driving slowly so that people who've, who've gathered will have an opportunity uh, to catch a glimpse of the King and Queen Consort. Um, there's no real reason for anybody else to be on the street today. That's, that's what people are, are there for, and certainly people up near the castle itself will be hoping that the, the Queen... That, well, the Queen indeed and the King will, will take time to, uh, to have a chat and to look at the tributes that have been left, because many tributes have been left uh, to the Queen 
on the square just in front of, of the castle. So they've come up Lisburn Street, and then we saw the, uh, the Presbyterian Church, um, the point at which it can be said that uh, people are entering the original village proper, beginning with a typical Northern Ireland rural street with mainly two story rows of houses opening straight onto the street following the line of the old Belfast to Dublin coach road. And you can see them now Short distance coming up the now. main mm. street, just the parish church they're passing now. Um, this week the church bells have been ringing a peal not heard since back in 1952, which we'll hear um, more about shortly. Um, the Mo war memorial in front of the church's grounds unveiled three decades earlier to mark the fallen from Royal Hillsborough and surrounding villages. And as the vehicles move into Royal Hillsborough's main street, the houses in this historic Georgian settlement, they become a bit larger, more imposing, more important looking, Gloria. That was your end, I assume. And as you get closer to the heart of the village and to Hillsborough Castle itself, it's really quite grand. It's very grand, and also as the cars will turn in now to the main gate, the Georgian houses just uh, on the right-hand side are still in perfect condition and beautiful. I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I think it's the prettiest village, I know I'm biased, but yeah. prettiest village in Northern Ireland. I think, I think it is. You can see some of the archways there behind the crowds, and those date from when carriage access to the rear of uh, those buildings along the main street was, was required. Here we go. And there's the turn. Mm -hmm. Yep. The vehicles pulling into the small square beside Hillsborough Castle's entrance. And that was originally a marketplace. Um, the stone building at its centre was once a courthouse and then until fairly recently home to the village's visitor information centre. And there is King Charles III emerging from his vehicle. Uh, Camilla, Queen Consort, by his side. Uh, being greeted there by the Lord Lieutenant of County Down, gone, Rowan Hamilton. And as it happens, he lives in his own rather impressive castle about 30 miles away, Killy Lay Castle, which is reportedly Northern Ireland's oldest inhabited castle. I and love indeed, it when you do a walkabout. Yeah, and this is the walkabout that everybody, certainly in the crowd, would have been hoping for. Uh, the Queen Consort and the <laughs> King shaking boys, hands. Boys face. Yeah, real. Lots of outstretched hands. I always think, I always feel sorry for the people whose hands are proffered and not shaken. <laughs> Can't shake them all. And the ones lots, that, of, lots of mobile phones as well taking pictures. <laughs> and the ones that are shaken, they don't get washed for ages. <laughs> <laughs> lots of school children in the front. They, they look very pleased to be there, don't they? I like that. And Prince Charles, or King Charles. Uh, using both hands to greet people. And they're really right up beside the gates of the, the castle here, Peter. Yeah. Just a matter of a few steps away. The, uh, <laughs> the just through the gates is a very large circular yeah. lawn and it just reminded me of another Bobby story. On the day of the Queen's visit, the, for the George Cross, Bobby chose that day to dig up an ancient <laughs> bone right in the middle of the circular lawn. It was quickly relayed, but they were not happy. Bobby had never done anything like that before or since, I might say. No, Bobby was clearly his own man. He um, was very much. We're, we're going to see the very imposing <laughs> gates at the front of Hillsborough Castle in just a moment or two, Rich Hill uh, gates. N not an original feature of Hillsborough Castle, uh, somewhat controversially, the gates were actually removed from Rich Hill Castle in County Armagh back in 1936 before later being installed at Royal Hillsborough and the gates had originally been erected in Rich Hill back in 1745 and there is in fact a campaign by some people to have them returned there. Uh, some people think it's inappropriate that they have been uh, who, who installed. Decide, who decided that they should be liberated from Rich Hill? Was that a... I'm not sure. <laughs> and who, whoever it like, like was isn't around Bay. to speak for him or herself these yeah. days. Um, flowers being offered. I mean, the people um, look very happy, Gloria, yeah. and, uh, and it has to be said, 
King Charles and the Queen Consort look equally happy. Well, yes, and also the lead up to this particular day for people in Northern Ireland and particularly in Hillsborough, you know, has been enormous. So uh, the village has been scrutinised and I'm told by some friends back there that you couldn't get into the village hardly for a while. Yeah, a lot of today, disruption, I'm sure. Of course, but today it's full. The excitement, you can just feel it, really. And I still have some butterflies in my tummy because... You know, it's funny as you're coming up the hill, you know, you know every shop you took your children to to buy things or the butchers on the left hand side. Or, <laughs> you know, just a familiarity really. Well, I'm sure the people of Hillsborough, if they've recorded this and they're watching it tonight, later, will be very pleased that you're here speaking on their behalf <laughs> and uh, giving such a special insight into the, the background of the, of the village and, and, and why it's such a special place. Yes. I think because it's small and intimate and everybody knows everybody else, you know. Now sometimes, as Peter might know, that's a bit of a disadvantage, they know all your business. Yeah. But on the other hand, it's a very nice feeling. And when I left Hillsborough to come and work in London, I couldn't believe that people didn't talk to each other in a lift and things like that, because in Northern Ireland we talk to everybody. But that friendliness in the village is superb. Always free with their views. Always yeah. free with their <laughs> views, of course. <clears throat> Did they tell you, Peter, if they thought you weren't getting it quite right? Oh, my goodness, did they tell me. <laughs> but, I mean, in the Secretary of State, you literally never please everyone all the time, and at times you can just offend everyone. You know, both sides want everything their own way. You disappoint both, and therefore you're sort of almost sort of equally criticised. Look at the number of people. Yeah. I have to tell you, the way the Irish talk, you might have to look at this for quite a long time. Well, it is quite interesting <laughs> because... The schedule has slipped a little bit, yes. it's running slightly behind time, but there is no sense that the King and Queen Consort want to rush this. No. They, they, no. they obviously feel this is a very important part of the, the process, Paul, because if this is about the new King getting around the United Kingdom and meeting his people, this kind of face-to-face -face interaction is very important. Yes, it definitely is. And there is no question, it brings home a very simple mm -hmm. point about the monarchy, that it is a force for stability. And one of the things it, it, the stability works for is in the survival of the United Kingdom, which is not something we can take for granted at all at this yeah. particular moment. But that the monarchy is a force for stability is, is no question. All four nations of the United Kingdom, and you can see the way that is playing out now here in, in, in Hillsborough and by the whole attitude of the crowds. Uh, and the pleasure that the crowd is taking uh, in this occasion, and the warmth with which the king and the queen consort are responding to the crowd, which is very, very striking. And, and there is a bit right, of... Uh, they're a bit behind time. They're not rushing it. They're, they're, they're certainly not rushing. There's a bit of pomp and ceremony to come. We have a, a 21-gun salute uh, very shortly right. when the king and queen consort actually go through the state entrance. Um, and then there'll be an interesting change with the flag. Peter, you'll be familiar with this as well because um, the Union flag will be replaced by the Royal Standard yes. as the Royal Couple mm. enter the grounds. And again, that will be the first time that Hillsborough Castle has flown the Royal Standard for, for King for Charles. The king, yes. Yes, you really have the feeling of a totally historic day then, don't you? Oh, when you're watching this it. is going to be long in people's memories. Mm, no, there's definitely. absolutely no question of that. The thing I also loved in some, some of the other walkabouts with the King, that people felt that they could give him a kiss or give him a hug. Well, you know, someone, he was that approachable yeah. that they felt yeah, they could do that. I think a couple of days ago someone asked him if, uh, if, she, if she could kiss him and he said yes. And they did. And she did. Oh, she did, I know. Somebody else kissed his hand and, you know, so he has that uh, approachability really. Peter, you were going to say something. No, at least his hand wasn't licked. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as by your dog. Well, he's not met Bobby. <coughs> yeah. So let's make a point about the Queen Consort. You know, 20 years ago, one wouldn't have imagined her being embraced in quite the way that she has with such warmth uh, by the public. You know, we were in the aftermath of a very, very difficult uh, period. And the transformation that she has undergone in her relationship uh, with uh, uh, the public, I think is very, very striking indeed. She hasn't forced it. She hasn't been, as it were, sort of precipitate. She's taken things one step 
at a time. She's, I think, been very, very well judged in the I way that she, she has uh, approached what could have been a very difficult. I think that she took a lot of advice, I mean, I'm yeah. surmising this, from the Queen, because the Queen never sort of complains, never explains, and Queen Consort has followed that because, as you rightly say, 20 yeah. years ago, she had a lot to deal with, but she has managed to ride that out. And she's very warmly received now. Yeah. And I thought that the King talked very, very beautifully about her yeah. at the proclamation and beyond. Mm -hmm. he, the, the, the King uses the word love more than once in a very striking way when, yes. in his broadcast. Yes. Yeah. It, 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 not just in relation to his, his wife, but he, there, again, as somebody who has in the past been portrayed as, you know, slightly remote, slightly chilly, um, I think people are really seeing in him, you know, a warmth. I mean, he really is quite a, in a sense, quite an ordinary person doing an extraordinary job. Um, and he has normal, ordinary emotions. And there's... There we are. There's a corgi, <laughs> there's which I well believe has just dog. licked Prince Charles, oh, or King wonderful. Charles's hand, well, he's, if I'm not much mistaken. Yeah. Then that is his initiation. That's, he is now well and truly... <laughs> that's the, that's <laughs> the new you, Northern Ireland Hillsborough welcome. Dog it, it's the Hillsborough dog licking. He, he, he is now very firmly in his stride. Um, and, and as you say, the king looks very relaxed, very comfortable talking to people. Maybe this kind of exchange, uh, Gloria, is is a, a bit of relief because you know later in the day the tone changes. It's of more course. somber as we have the um, the service reflecting on the contribution. Her Majesty of was Her Majesty the same. Queen. I feel that you know when she was in walkabout, she's very engaged, and that's what I've just been watching Charles speaking very intently to some of the people. I think they're now. Into the castle. Making their way towards the castle, but perhaps going to look at some of these floral tributes, yes, which have been laid on the on the steps. Beautiful. Um, yeah, and they are, and that's residents of Hillsborough and beyond taking the time to come and, and lay those tributes. This is a shot from a picture from inside the castle, and again we're back outside again. You saw the very impressive railings by those rich hill gates, and that's a sea of. Mm floral tributes. That's amazing, actually, for a small village. That's um, quite, quite remarkable. A very, very big occasion for the, um, the head of Hillsborough Castle, Laura McCurry, who's had an awful lot of work to do uh, in making sure that everything goes according to plan. Well, she and many others. There are the, the famous, infamous Rich Hill Gates. Um, and the Sea of Flowers continues. Laura McCorry, I mentioned there, uh, who runs Hillsborough Castle, she'll be officially uh, greeting the King and Queen Consort when they uh, approach the state entrance in, in just a few moments, we think. So the, the walkabout seems to have come to an end and the King and the Queen Consort are, are, are waving to members of the public. A few calls of God save the King going up and they approach the gates. And um, very soon, the flag will change. There we go. There we are. The Union flag is down and the Royal Standard is being flown over Hillsborough Castle for the first time for King Charles III. And the Lord Lieutenant there, gone Rowan Hamilton, escorting the King and Queen Consort up the driveway the lawns, the gardens looking very impressive, up to the state entrance. And they'll go inside and then they have a series of meetings. Who are they inside. meeting today? Well, they're meeting the Secretary <coughs> of State, they meet the party leaders, uh, they meet invited guests. And then Alex Maskey, who's the Speaker of the Assembly, um, will deliver a message of condolence on behalf of the people of Northern Ireland and the King will reply and we'll see that. We'll see both the message from the Speaker and the reply. The Royal Gun Salute is going to happen very soon. That's Laura McCurry there, the head of Hillsborough Castle, welcoming the King and the Queen Consort and that's the state entrance and the 
Step inside and you can hear the Royal Gun Salute coming from 206 Ulster Battery Royal Artillery, uh, firing from the terrace at Hillsborough Castle. They'll fire 21 rounds at the rate of six rounds per minute. And this is a change from normal procedures. A gun salute's normally fired when the monarch sets foot in Northern Ireland. This gun salute is taking place instead at Hillsborough Castle on the arrival of the King. And Hillsborough Castle is one of only eight primary saluting stations across the United Kingdom. 206 Ulster Battery are based in Northern Ireland and split between bases in Newton Ards, just outside Belfast, and Coleraine up in the northwest. And there we see a shot of the state entrance of Hillsborough Castle with the Royal Standard fluttering in the breeze. And that terrace, Peter, is beautiful. Yeah. Well, it's more beautiful now even than I remember it. <laughs> There's been quite a lot of planting going on. There's a lot terrace. of work going on, Peter. This is making me... And there's a lovely, lovely high shot of uh, Hillsborough Castle. And I think you get some sense of the scale of the building. Because, Gloria, while you said it's not a castle, it is a large house. It is a very large house. Very large house, yes. But comfortable, you know. Some, some castles are quite austere and you don't feel sort of really uh, relaxed in them. But th this home, it is a home. Large, albeit. But it's beautifully kept and beautiful furniture and the kitchen staff there are just on it all the time. Mm. The hospitality is amazing. Well, the King is due to spend some time shortly in a private session with the new Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Chris Heaton-Harris. He was appointed to that job by the new Prime Minister last Tuesday, so seven days in the job. And uh, he's a, a very busy man. And the sound of Hillsborough parish church's bells has been heard across Royal Hillsborough since the Queen's death. Over these past few days, however, they've sounded very different from their usual peal, in a way not heard for seven decades. Tower captain at the church, Simon Walker, explains more now and reflects on life with the occasional royal neighbour. I've lived in Hillsborough all my life. In fact, I'm at least the 10th generation to live in Hillsborough. Everybody has a memory of some royal visit. My earliest memory is when I was seven years old, the Queen visited Hillsborough for her Silver Jubilee. And my primary school class were taken to the castle and we all met the Queen. Now that's, that's 40 years ago, but I've never forgotten that. And I know the buzz that local people get from seeing royalty. There's the anticipation, will they see them? Will they not see them? Will they get to speak to them? And I know that my own children, who are very small, one of their treasured memories is coming home from primary school one day, and on the way home, they saw the Queen's car, and she waved at them, and that's something they'll never forget. Our records go back as far as 1837, when there's a record of us ringing for the passing of William IV, and at that stage, the bells were rung continuously for four days. The last time we rang the bells for the passing of a monarch was, of course, with the passing of George VI in 1952. Normally, when we ring the bells, the bells don't have their clappers muffled. Uh, they usually sound quite joyous. For the passing of a monarch, what we do is we have leather caps or muffles which are tied round each side or each face of the clapper, which strikes the inside of each bell. And it's an effect that people only hear once in a lifetime or once every two generations. It really sounds quite mournful, but quite respectful. Those of us who have to actually climb up in amongst the bells to tie the muffles onto them will feel sad. This is a lady who not only has been our sovereign, but has been the backdrop for people's lives for two, two and a half generations. And given the service that she's given to the country and the selflessness that she's shown, I think it'd be difficult not to be upset and to recognise that this is the end of an era. Lovely. Now let's stay in Royal Hillsborough, where Mark Simpson has been joined by a very special guest. 
Yes, we'll talk to the former world champion boxer Carl Frampton in a moment. He's able to say what a lot of people now in Royal Hillsborough are able to say. He's met the new king. He met him when he was Prince of Wales, of course. Carl Frampton, you're very welcome. We watched the new king and Camilla walk past us. They were right in front of us a few minutes ago. What are your reflections today? It's, just, it's a really momentous occasion. It's an honour and a privilege for me to be invited here. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a huge moment in history, really. Um, British history, I suppose world history as well. So uh, an honour to be here. The people behind you will be able to say, I've met him, you've met him before. What are your reflections on, on Prince Charles, now King Charles? Yeah, I, I met him as the prince at the time, a couple of years ago with my wife as well. Um, very personable, funny as well. I had, had a chat maybe three minutes or so with him, but it, it, it felt like a long time, but it was really enjoyable. And we got some lovely photographs that we'll, we'll treasure forever. You mention your wife, Christine. She's from the other side of the community in Northern Ireland mm. as such. You're a Protestant, she's a Catholic, you got together. You're seen as kind of the symbol of the new Northern Ireland, the new Northern Ireland that the Queen tried to promote with reconciliation. Yeah, the, the, the Queen was uh, obviously, the, the appearance in Dublin where she spoke Irish as well um, at the banquet, I think in 2011. Um, a, a massive occasion in terms of reconciliation and peace in Northern Ireland and also the moment when, when she shook hands with, with Martin McGuinness. That was a, a very symbolic moment, I think, for this country. And finally, you're wearing the MBE. What does that mean to you? Uh, it means so much. Uh, to, to me and my family, a very proud moment um, when I collected it in 2016. Yeah, um, first time I've actually wore it. Very, very proud. <laughs> well, it's had a good debut here at Royal Hillsborough. Carl Frampton, thank you very much indeed. A lot of chat, a lot of chatter outside Hillsborough Castle. We hope to hear from inside shortly and the first words on Northern Irish soil from the new king. Well, right now the king is having a private audience with the Secretary of State and following that he'll meet the leaders of the five main political parties in Northern Ireland and the Speaker of the Assembly. Joining me now is Peter Sheridan, Chief Executive of Cooperation Ireland, an organisation that works across the island to build peace and whose joint patron was the Queen, a role she shared with the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins. Also with us is the artist Colin Davidson, who's probably best known for his large-scale portraits. He's painted a series of portraits of victims of the Troubles and a long list of luminaries, among them Seamus Heaney, Brad Pitt, Liam Neeson and Bill Clinton. Without doubt, his most important work was of Her Majesty the Queen in May 2016. Welcome to both of you. Thank it's you. lovely to have you involved today. Um, Peter, the political scene in, in Northern Ireland is, as we just heard in our previous conversation, in limbo at the moment with the Northern Ireland Assembly currently suspended. Um, of course, the monarch has to remain strictly neutral with respect to political matters, but it's hard to imagine, isn't it, that the King wouldn't want to talk to the Secretary of State about the current political landscape in Northern Ireland. Yes, I'm sure they will in, in, in private, and, but I suppose, you know, from the late Queen and Prince Charles, they, they've transcended politics, particularly party politics. Um, politics in its wider sense, of course, it, it, it can't be avoided in it. But when you look back at the Queen's speech in Dublin Castle, you know, where she referenced things like uh, bound to the past but not being bound by it and, and asking people here to think beyond just the here and now where she said that all of us had been as a consequence of our troubled past and where she reached out, extended the, her condolences and sympathy to everybody and she didn't qualify it. Uh, but that party politics the Queen transcended and, and, and the King will as well. Um, Colin, We'll come on to the Queen's direct part in the reconciliation process later, and you were a witness to that. But uh, I want to talk about your personal connection to the Queen. You met her on a number of occasions. What distinguishes you is that she agreed to be painted by you in 2016. So for people who don't know how that happened, how did it come about, and what was the experience like? Well, I suppose we've got to go back to 2012, the meeting, uh, the Cooperation Ireland event at the Lyric Theatre. Um, and we witnessed a momentous handshake during that particular time, which was meant to be an arts event. It kind of was an arts event. I showed the delegation paintings of mine, which were hanging there. And from then on, I think um, 
it was deemed as being appropriate, I think, that there should be a Northern Irish or an Irish painting of the Queen, bearing in mind the huge strides, the, hu the, the hand of friendship which she stretched to us all. Um, I think that time was, was right for that. 2016, it was May, um, I was invited to the palace to spend two hours with the Queen. Uh, the sitting was in the yellow drawing room and I can remember um, being out of my depth completely. That's just how I, how I felt. Um, I was standing, um, our appointment was at 11 a.m. Uh, that day in May. And I can remember standing by the door waiting for the Queen to walk in and the changing of the guard just struck up outside. Of course, I remember in my younger days um, standing outside the gates wa watching the changing of the guard. So to hear the band, to see them, and at that stage the Queen just to walk in was just something that I will forever hold de dear. And uh, you know, we were off to a good start because she quipped with me how appropriate it was that it was the Irish guards playing that day. And I think I also then had the nerve to say to her, um, Mom, uh, it's probably the millionth time that I've, uh, or that someone has wished you a happy birthday, but may I do it too? And she stopped in her tracks and turned around and went, yes, I think it is about the millionth time. So we, there was a lightness, her warmth, and also the fact that she made me completely feel at my ease, which is a story that we've heard so many times. Mm. Um, we we're just looking at, at, at a picture, in fact, of the painting, which you unveiled, um, or she unveiled, in a, in a gathering in London, about six months later, I think it was, live pictures, or pictures here, recorded at the time, of her unveiling it. And uh, of course, you, you had no idea what she was going to make of it, because she hadn't seen it before. No, this was the first time she had seen it. And in fact, Peter, um, was just telling the story of him coming and grabbing me to go and speak to her. Because I was, I sometimes don't know, Mark, why I choose to be in the same room as somebody whenever the portrait's unveiled for the first time, because they're seeing my interpretation of them four foot square. So Peter came and grabbed me, and again, I don't know where the nerve came from, but I, the first thing I said to her was, are you still talking to me, ma'am? And of course she turned around with that familiar smile that I had seen during those two hours that we spent together and said, of course, I'm still talking to you and commented on how splendid the painting was. So that is something which I hold dear. Um, He's probably been uh, slightly um, understating it because what happened when I went to grab up, because this was at a 1916 rising event uh, commemoration that we were unveiled at Crosby Hall in London. And when I grabbed Colin and brought him up, it was the Queen turned around and looked over her shoulder and said, Oh, Colin, lovely to see you. Well, I think that's a very interesting um, and telling insight into mm. how the Queen approached things and uh, the way in which she connected with things that mattered to her. We're going to come back and talk about all of that in a bit more detail in just a moment or two. But th thank you both uh, for now. Later this afternoon, our attention will, of course, turn to Belfast Cathedral for the service of reflection marking the life of Queen Elizabeth II, which is due to begin at 3 o'clock. Situated to the north of the city centre, the cathedral is known locally as St Anne's. And joining us from there now is my colleague Tara Mills. Well, this is Donegal Street, uh, in the heart of what used to be the commercial part of Belfast and indeed two of the city's oldest buildings, the old exchange and the old prayer house, are at either end of the street. And the, the sun is still shining here this afternoon and this is the location for the service of thanksgiving and reflection for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. So who are we expecting to attend alongside the royal couple? Well the Prime Minister Liz Truss is on her first visit to Northern Ireland since becoming Prime Minister. She's expected to attend along with the Irish President Michael D Higgins and the Taoiseach Micheál Martin. And lots of people have started to gather here in Ryder's Square. The first people to arrive were from the Girl Guides. They had travelled from Dungannon this morning, had an early start, and they're right at the front of the barriers, very much hoping 
that when the king and the queen consort do their short walkabout after the service here in Ryder Square, that they'll get a chance to shake their hands and catch a few words with them. And just in the last few minutes, some students from British Belfast Royal Academy have arrived, along with some other school children, members of the Orange Order here as well. And I took a stroll through the cathedral a little earlier. The flowers are spectacular. They've just finished rehearsing some of the music. And there was definitely a sense of nervous apprehension, but a promise of a very warm welcome to the royal couple. Now, someone who knows Belfast Cathedral better than most and who played a key role in the shape of this afternoon's service is the Dean of Belfast, the very Reverend Stephen Ford. Appointed to the position in 2018, he was brought up in County Down in Northern Ireland and ordained as a priest in 1987. The Dean reflects now on this afternoon's service. <laughs> I think we could say that this is a very unique service. It obviously brings traditions and understandings that we would take from other services, but as a service of thanksgiving for a life I lived to the full, uh, in that sense it is similar to other services. There are elements of the service, we've devised it for Belfast, which are unique to this island and this nation. For example, the hymns that we have chosen are, are hymns that are very familiar to uh, congregations uh, across the island and have a particular Irish feel to them. Uh, the nature of those who are, are participating in the service is obviously drawn from right across the community and reflects the particular emphases and nature of society here in Northern Ireland and across the island as well. And yet it is also an intensely personal service because within this service the king will be reflecting upon his mother, reflecting upon her life as we give thanks for that life. But he brings to this service also his own sense of grief. And so what we are doing is something very special and very personal to the king and to those who are closest to him as members of the royal family. So we give thanks to God for the life of Queen Elizabeth, but we do something which we do for every family. Uh, as a community of faith, we surround them with our care and we offer them in our prayers to Almighty God, as well as gathering to offer our thanksgiving that he is stepping into this new role as King. I think the fact that it is a service of thanksgiving for the reign of the Queen, and the Queen has reigned for decades for many, many people, perhaps two generations of people, we have known no other monarch. She has given leadership to the country at times of great celebration herself, but also at times of huge national tragedy. And those who have met her have always found her uh, a person uh, who, who has had the right word to say, uh, who knows the right thing to do. She has guided prime ministers and presidents. Uh, she has stood alongside ordinary people. She has been the longest serving monarch that uh, the United Kingdom has known. And it will be a very long time before anybody uh, would be in a position to exceed that. Very Reverend Stephen Ford, Dean of Belfast. Now, just to update you on proceedings at Hillsborough, the King is about to go into a private meeting with the leaders of the five main political parties and the Speaker of the Stormont Assembly. Uh, just after a quarter past one, he will receive a message of condolence on behalf of the people of Northern Ireland from the Speaker, Alex Maskey, who's a member of Sinn Féin. Now, the largest political party in Northern Ireland, Sinn Féin previously had a policy of not attending events with members of the UK's royal family, but that all changed in a landmark meeting in 2012, which both of my guests were, in fact, heavily involved in. Um, Peter, again, for the benefit of people who don't understand how that came about, that was the meeting between Her Majesty the Queen and the Sinn Féin leader in Northern Ireland, Martin McGuinness, who was, of course, a former IRA commander, and you were involved in helping to make that happen. Yeah, well, I, I think 
uh, all of that came from a recognition, probably by Sinn Féin, that they, they had been absent in the state visit to Dublin and, and they recognised, like everybody else, that um, Irish people's affection for the Queen grew as she moved from Dublin to Cork uh, and, and they recognised that at some stage they were going to have to engage in it. So um, as the Queen and the President were our joint patrons, we put together this event along with the governments that we built around Collins' portraits and then we invited the First and Deputy First Minister to attend and as at that stage Martin McGill was the Deputy First Minister. We weren't quite sure right up until the last minute whether it was going to happen. I think there were probably many in Sinn Féin who did want it to happen but there were probably many who didn't want it to happen as well. Mm. We're just seeing pictures of that handshake now and, uh, and, it, and it was momentous. It was, well I, I remember saying to myself that uh, I wanted to capture it in slow motion because I knew it was a significant moment in history. I, I said to myself that uh, uh, despite the extraordinary na nature of it, there was also an ordinariness to it in that here were two people who met, smiled, shook hands and said hello. And Colin, you were there, you witnessed it as well. Yeah, and indeed we, we both were, of course, you and your, um, your role as the chairman of the Derek. Um, I think for me, what has always stayed with me is the warmth that I feel that the delegation kind of displayed that day. Okay, I was showing them paintings of mine, but there, there was an engagement between them. There wasn't um, a physical, I mean, the proximity was, was close and there was even the odd quip. And I, I think that made me feel, having grown up um, in the place, you know, f since 1968, you know, th that was a very special time. And I think we felt many things starting to thaw. And to have been there at that arts event and to have seen that firsthand again is something which I will hold dear. Yeah, and they went on, of course, um, to meet several times uh, and developed a, a, a rapport. And we can talk about that later. And um, I think that uh, King Charles, as he now is, of course, has uh, developed that relationship with um, leading figures within Sinn Féin as, as well, which I know, Peter, you can, you can talk to us about. Now, perhaps one of the most defining moments the Queen played in the peace process came uh, in May 2011. It remains a unique moment in Irish and British history. The President's guest of honour at a state dinner in Dublin was Queen Elizabeth II, who was undertaking what was the first state visit by a British monarch to the Republic of Ireland. It had been a hundred years since a reigning British monarch had set foot in the country, though back when King George V visited, Ireland was still under British rule. Her Majesty's 2011 visit was enormously symbolic and, as one journalist put it, the Queen was doing a lot more than simply turning up and bowing at the right moment. Belfast-born Mary McAleese was installed as the Irish President in 1997, the country's first to come from Northern Ireland. Here she reflects on that historic visit by the Queen. <laughs> The visit of the Queen to Ireland was hailed by President Mary McAleese as an extraordinary moment in Irish history. This picture is my favourite from the events of 2011. This is the Garden of Remembrance. She's looking at a monument designed to respect, admire and indeed encourage the legacy of those who held in their heart the dream of Irish nationhood. We had just laid the wreaths and when she stepped back she just suddenly just nodded her head in respect. And it was that gesture, I think, that caused really gasps all over Ireland, the realisation this is not just any visit. There's something profound going on here. Croke Park, the beating heart of the GAA and the scene in 1920 of a massacre when Crown forces opened fire at a challenge match and 14 people lost their lives. I would never have asked the GAA to invite her if I had not known first that she would go, knowing all of that history. It was her choice to go out onto the hallowed sward. I mean, nobody was pushing that. And it was Christy Cooney who said to her, the president of the GAA, he said, you know, ma'am, you're standing on the place where in 1920 the British troops, you know, opened fire. I still remember her looking 
at the two of us, looking up and looking back, and the sadness that was in her face. And she just said so solemnly, I know, I know. And you knew that she did know, and she felt it. I think when she came here, the full extent of what she understood about the role of Britain in Ireland and the baleful role, historically, there's no other way of saying it, which was not well understood by the English people. I mean, the English people don't know Irish history very well. I think that she sort of felt that she had an obligation um, to address that. Argus <laughs> Earlier that day, the gift I had given her was a little book of Irish phrases. When she sat down, I said, you got fluent very quickly. Just thought that was so brave of her. From the get-go, we knew that this was a woman on a mission to hit all the subjects that needed to be dealt with if we were to effect a true reconciliation. I think many of us recognise that she operated in a different space from everyday politics. And so our hope would be that legacy that she invested so heavily in in 2011 will inspire her son as king. Mary McAleese on the Queen's landmark visit to Ireland 11 years ago. Peter Sheridan, just put that into some kind of context for us. Well, I think when we look back at it, it was the building of the modern British-Irish relationship that we see today. You know, when the Queen landed in Dublin and the wearing of her green uh, dress, shamrocks on it, the speaking of Irish at her, her, at the, at her um, speech, then the travel down to Cork and meeting people. Um, all of that were momentous occasions in terms of building British-Irish relationships and about peace and reconciliation. I think most people in Ireland at that stage could see that the Queen had peace and reconciliation in her heart. And, and when, I mean, I often said it would do us all the world of good to read her speech um, and, and get us back onto line again in terms of Northern Ireland politics. And Peter, is it your firm view that it wasn't just about the circumstances the Queen found herself in? She was the author of that transformative relationship? Well, I suspect that the Queen didn't do anything that she didn't want to do. And, uh, and, and when you think back to those times and now, you know, move forward to today to see the enormous progress we made. Yes, we've still got difficulties, but in terms of Anglo-Irish relations, peace and reconciliation, there's nobody led it better than the Queen. And I think Sinn Féin acknowledged that over recent days. And we shouldn't forget the fact that um, during that visit, she paid tribute. She laid a wreath and bowed her head to those who fought on behalf of Ireland against British forces. That sense of respect of the laying of the wreath at the Garden of Remembrance and then also at Island Bridge. Um, all of those were momentous, uh, taken individually, but taken together, um, I think they, they, as I've said, that they, they have built the modern day relationship between Britain and Ireland. Colin, just briefly, what are your recollections of um, that visit in 2011? Well, I think what Peter said there that is so important is that the Queen, he suspects the Queen wouldn't have done anything that she didn't want to do. What we've got to remember is that, okay, as head of state, her reaching out that hand of, friend of friendship was one thing, but as somebody who suffered personal loss through the troubles, that was something else completely. So as head of state, huge strides. As a human being, massive strides as well. Thank you both. Now, while Northern Ireland's official book of condolence is online, other books have been opened at locations across Northern Ireland, allowing the public to pay their respects to the Queen in person. Belfast's City Hall has been one of the busiest venues. Crowds are gathering again today, hoping to catch a glimpse of the King and the Queen Consort as they pass en route to Belfast Cathedral. And Holly Hamilton is there. Yes, there's a, a real sense of excitement and anticipation here at Belfast City Hall, a, a building, of course, that has witnessed some key moments in history, as it will once again today, when King Charles III makes his way through these streets He'll be following in the footsteps of his great 
grandfather. Yes, more than 100 years ago, June 1921 to be precise, King George V and Queen Mary made their way through these same streets, very similar to today, lined with spectators with flags and bunting all hoping to get a glimpse of the king and queen consort. Now, their visit back then was an historic one. It came just seven weeks after the creation of Northern Ireland, and they were here for the state opening of the Northern Ireland Parliament, which was within these walls behind me at Belfast City Hall, of course. Uh, Stormont, the home of the Assembly today, hadn't even been built yet. Now, the birth of Northern Ireland, well, it wasn't welcomed by everyone, of course, but it did mark the beginning of a new era for this part of the world, just as the arrival of King Charles III here in Northern Ireland marks the beginning of a new chapter for the royal family. Now, we know that the king won't be stopping off here today. That hasn't stopped spectators arriving in their thousands, all hoping just to catch a glimpse of the king and queen consort. And that's what they've told me, just a glimpse. They just want to be a small part of history. Well, with me now is the well-known Northern Ireland export, the broadcaster and journalist Eamon Holmes. Welcome to you. Yeah. Um, very interesting day as far as Northern Ireland is concerned, absolutely. Eamon. Absolutely, absolutely. I was six years old when I first saw the Queen and Mary McAleese, the Irish president there. I would have grown up in North Belfast, a nationalist stroke Republican um, area, and listening to her talks of reconciliation, and I think almost this Queen should be known as... You know, Diana was the people's princess. I think Queen Elizabeth was the, uh, the queen of peace, almost. I think that's what, what she could be remembered for. In 1966, when I first saw her, I lived in the New Lodge Road in North Belfast, and I remember my mother, so that would have been a Catholic nationalist area, and we went to the Antrim Road, and I remember seeing her come down the Antrim Road, Cliftonville Road, Antrim Road, uh, bullet behind bulletproof glass, and waving out. And you knew you were some, somebody special. So often, where, where, the, where she's painted as a unionist queen or a loyalist queen or whatever, she's also a celebrity. So to a lot of people, it's Charles there today, it's celebrityhood and it's important to people in Northern Ireland to be recognised like that. Mm. But she also stretched herself. We heard Peter Sheridan and Colin Davidson yeah. talking about that. Um, she extended uh, the hand of friendship to, to people who were involved in indirectly hurting her family in the past. Abs absolutely, absolutely. I think there have been great strides, Mark, and I think Charles will continue that. I think he's a very accessible man. I think Camilla is anyone who's met her. It's very strange for me being, you know, a North Belfast Catholic, thinking when I was a kid, this was not my queen. And then, because, you know, it was made obvious in loyalist areas, it was their queen, it wasn't our queen. And yet, when I went to England in 1986 and I went to Mass, they prayed for the queen on Sunday. So they prayed for the Queen at a Catholic Mass. And I remember, I find this really strange, and you realise she was a Queen for all people, a Queen for all faiths, in a way as well. And she did stretch herself. And, and I think um, when I look and, you know, I surprisingly rub shoulders with royals on a, a regular basis, because a lot of it is celebrityhood. They mix in fundraising circles, they mix in high profile events and things, and you get to know them relatively well. Um, it was interesting hearing Gloria talking earlier about uh, the occasion she received her OBE from the Queen yeah. and she, uh, against protocol, strict protocol, put her hand on top of the Queen's and probably had a longer conversation than she should have. You did something quite um, against protocol as well, I gather. Well, you're told that you have, um, you probably have about a minute and a half with her. She holds your hand, and when she's finished with you, she pushes your hand back. And um, so when it got to my chance with her, she said, you must have interviewed a lot of people in your time. And I said, yes, Mum, I've interviewed everyone in your family with one exception. And she said, really, who's that? I said, you, Mum, you. I said, but we could fix that today because we're near the end of the line. There's a space over there. I've got my phone. We could do a quick chat, and there that would square the circle. That would be it. It would all, all be super. And she went, <laughs> and she pushed my hand. So I got 20 seconds with her, really. That was it. She, it was like, get this madman out of here. But she had a sense of humour, um, very accessible, quite dry in, in her wit. And, um, yeah, and, and, you know, I would find that about all of them. All of them uh, are quite keen to... Uh, I'm sure you've met royalty in your time, but they, they know about you and they want to be interested in you as well. Um, and you and she, of course, shared 
an interest in in horse racing. And she she she's well known as someone who was passionate about that. She, and and yeah. you're fairly keen on the horses too. Well, she was an expert. I mean, she was a breeder. Um, she was very into animal welfare as well. There's a big scandal in horse racing about what happens to horses after they finish their their working life. And she was very keen to know where her horses went to, who would have them, what they would be used for afterwards. Um, and she was, she was an expert in horse flesh. And, and you could tell that a woman under such scrutiny and always giving, this was her escape. This was where she could indulge herself. This is where, you know, it's like, it's like a lot of us, we all have a pastime or a hobby or whatever, and this was, this was hers, yeah. Yeah, and um, sometimes the public got to see how much she enjoyed it. We've got a great clip here of her at a, at a horse race in the early 1990s. You'll enjoy this. Hey, off! Look, it's on the wrong leg. No wonder it can't go around the corner. Look at that. She wasn't following royal protocol there, was she? No. She was but as, as you say, she, she was an expert. Most yeah. other people are, are very much amateurs. Yes, yeah, yeah. But she was. She knew her horse flesh. And uh, I mean, look at her track record as a breeder, as a trainer. And, um, and also, when you look, I mean, there's those amazing scenes where she went down the mile and she's sitting side saddle on that horse and the guy fires off the six blanks in the gun and the horse is completely spooked. She retains control. She's very calm in those situations. Uh, an exceptional human being, exceptional. Mm. Today's a difficult day for many people in Northern Ireland because there is uh, obviously a welcome for the new king and the queen consort, and we saw that, the very warm welcome they received yeah. in, in Royal Hillsborough. And then there is a, a very serious side to today's proceedings as well. We're about to hear the message of condolence read on behalf of the people of Northern Ireland by the Speaker of the Assembly, then a response by the King, and then that service of reflection uh, and thanks for the life of Queen Elizabeth II. And for a lot of people today, you would imagine in Northern Ireland, that will be very moving. Very, very moving, and I think it means a lot. And as I said at the start, I think she has done so much towards reconciliation. We as a people have moved. Sometimes we think we haven't moved at all, but then you look and you think, yeah, strides have been made. I mean, in my lifetime, there are definite changes of opinion and outlook the way uh, nationalist or Catholic people would look towards the royal family. And, um, uh, and I do think that is a very, very good thing. I want to ask you about the King. I uh, know that you've met him on a number of occasions and that um, you have a good relationship with the Queen Consort. Um, there's a lot of talk about how the monarchy might change, about how King Charles may do things his way. He may choose to do things differently, very differently or slightly differently. We don't know, of course, at this stage. What's your impression of him and how he will fulfill his new role. Mark, I think he's the best trained apprentice in the world. I think this man is ready for this. In many ways, I think maybe slightly unfortunate the Queen didn't abdicate 10 years ago or so, but it was a life of service. I think he will be the same. I think, you know, even if William was to step in at this stage, um, the nation would be very, very happy. But I think Charles will see through, like his mother, right to the end, it will be a time of service for him. And the Queen Consort, which we call her, we don't have to call her the Queen's Consort. She's the Queen out of respect, we'll wait until the Queen is buried. But then I think from next week, Camilla will be the Queen and we have to recognise her such as the Queen. And a very human person, a very... She wrote to me, she, she, she saw in an article that I had talked about how I got my first car with a loan through the credit union. And she wanted to expand credit unions within England particularly. And she wrote me a letter and I went to see her and we talked about credit unions and how you get a loan and what they do for communities and whatever. She's a very, she wants to be involved. She's a very accessible, friendly person, yeah. It's very interesting to hear your thoughts. Uh, Eamon, thank you so Thanks, much Thanks for, for joining much. us today. Good to see you. Now, the King will soon arrive in the throne room in Hillsborough Castle to receive the message of condolence from the Speaker of the Assembly on behalf of the people of Northern Ireland. Let's bring in our commentators Declan Harvey and Mark Devonport. Well, they've been sitting in silence for about 15 minutes here. You could hear a pin drop. This is the ceremonial heart 
of Hillsborough Castle, the throne room, every bit as impressive as the name suggests. It started life as three separate rooms back in the 1790s, but in the 1840s, the Hill family, from whom Royal Hillsborough gets its name, wanted a grand space for receptions and entertaining. It is quite literally, as they would have intended, a room fit for a king. Unlike other royal residences, Hillsborough Castle is not owned by the Crown, but by the UK government, who bought it in the 1920s after partition on the island. And that is why it is also the official residence of the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Chris Heaton-Harris, in the job exactly a week. And that goes to the mix that has historically happened at Hillsborough Castle of royalty and politics. Since we saw the King and the Queen Consort enter the building in the last half hour or so, they've caught their breath, they've met with the Secretary of State, and as you join us, they are just next door from the throne room in what's known as the Red Room, meeting with the leaders of the five political parties in Northern Ireland. I'm joined by the BBC's former political editor in Northern Ireland, Mark Devonport. Um, these meetings, they happen in private, away from the cameras. They are more casual than maybe more public meetings. But what do you think, if anything, can be achieved from them? Uh, well, I think that uh, King Charles has made it very clear that he wants to continue the legacy of his mother in terms of promoting uh, conciliation. And um, he will be emphasising, he's met some of these politicians before, but for those he hasn't met, I think he'll be emphasising uh, that his door is open, uh, that uh, he is there in order to promote continuing dialogue. Some of the empty chairs that you see um, in this room here are chairs that will be occupied by the leaders of the Stormont parties who are still in conversation with him and we will be hearing soon uh, from Alex Maskey who is the speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly um, and I think this uh, function that we're about to witness uh, will illustrate how far we've come but also that we're involved in an imperfect and unfinished process. Lady Mary Peters standing by with the rest of the dignitaries. Lady Mary Peters, of course, is one of Northern Ireland's most famous athletes, has uh, just celebrated uh, the uh, anniversary of winning a gold medal in the pentathlon in 1972. That was in Munich. And it's not just dignitaries in this room, Lord Lieutenants from across Northern Ireland. There has been a concerted effort to also invite other people, representatives of the emergency services are here, the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service, the Ambulance Service, the Police Service of Northern Ireland, and two representatives of the National Trust in Northern Ireland. Train driver Noel Playfair is here, so too is fireman Anto Dargan. And halfway down the aisle, there are two Two men with a particular story of a particular moment with the Queen. It's Dean of Enniskillen Cathedral, Reverend Kenneth Hall, and across from him, Enniskillen Parish Reverend Monsignor Peter O'Reilly. Mark, they were at the centre of a landmark event, really, weren't they, in 2012 when the Queen visited Enniskillen? Uh, she visited Enniskillen, which of course is uh, in Fermanagh and is uh, one of the towns, the cities of Northern Ireland that have been touched very grievously by the Troubles. But she made a point of attending a uh, Church of Ireland service and then walking very publicly across that main road uh, to uh, the, the Catholic Church just opposite uh, the Church of Ireland Church. And it was very much a, a public symbol of reaching out the hand between the denominations. And we've uh, in recent times heard uh, the two clerics who were involved saying that they felt almost like uh, the Queen uh, was putting them on the spot a little bit, making them uh, attest to having done their homework, because she said, as of course uh, the head of uh, the Anglican Church, um, that she wanted to know exactly what they'd been doing to promote reconciliation in their area. Well, the rich green silk damask walls were lovingly restored during the more recent restoration works at Hillsborough Castle. The exact same pattern in silk can also be found in red, hanging at Kensington Palace 
throughout the King's State Apartments there. And at the top of the room, you'll see the coat of arms. Local embroiderers created the piece. It was originally intended for George V, but so intricate was the work and so long did it take that it was his son Edward VIII who'd come to the throne by the time it was completed. <clears throat> so we're standing by now for the message of condolence. The first person we're going to see entering the room from the back is the Lord Lieutenant of Down, Gone Rowan Hamilton. He will be followed by the Speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly, Alex Maskey. The coat of arms. And you'd be forgiven, given the name of this room and the look of that furniture for thinking they were thrones. They are, in fact, not thrones. They are chairs of state. They represent the monarch in his absence. Officially, only the governors of Northern Ireland and their wives were allowed to sit on them. There hasn't, of course, been a governor since the cabinet role of Secretary of State was created in 1972. Mark, I want to talk a little bit about Alex Maskey, the speaker, um, member of Sinn Féin. And it is a remarkable personal journey that he has been on to find himself in this place on this day. Um, Alex Maskey, quite a character before he became an active politician. He was known uh, as a successful amateur boxer, famously losing only four out of 75 fights. So not somebody that you would want to cross lightly. Um, he took that um, uh, attitude onto politics, um, was uh, a supporter of the Republican movement, but was one of the earliest elected representatives elected to Belfast City Council back in 1983. Um, more recently now, as a veteran Republican, he has been elected into place as Speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, but uh, he was actually intending to step down from politics in the last Northern Ireland election, which took place in May. He is no longer an elected politician. Uh, but part and parcel of what is happening here in terms of continuing disagreements between the politicians means that that assembly is not sitting and they are not able to elect a successor uh, for Mr Maskey. So uh, that uh, peculiarity of our political history has put him in the spotlight today, that he is still there in place, still running the building up at Storm and will be delivering a message of condolence. And one reason uh, that it is a message uh, rather than a motion um, is that it is not happening in the Assembly, and that's a bit of a contrast to what happened in the Scottish Parliament yesterday and what will happen in the Welsh Senate uh, later on in the week. Uh, but it is also uh, the case uh, that if they had wanted to pass a motion, they couldn't have passed one because at the moment uh, we are still in a political vacuum and no motions are going through until they manage to resolve the matter. So just finishing their meeting in private with the King, Northern Ireland's political leaders and representatives of the five major parties. That's Alex, Alex Maskey, the speaker, taking his seat. You saw there Sinn Féin Vice President Michelle O'Neill, the leader of the DUP, Doug Beatty. There's Naomi Long of the Alliance, who's currently Justice Minister, again in a caretaker role. And it would have been nice to have been a fly on the wall in those meetings with the local <laughs> politicians because obviously uh, King Charles will be uh, no doubt using his good offices to promote um, as much compromise as possible. But I'm sure um, as the monarch, he would not want to get into the nitty gritty of the detail that separates them. Also here, leader of the DUP, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. This is very much his neck of the woods. He is the local MP. And such a difference in the throne room compared to the scenes we saw just outside Hillsborough Castle with the cheers and the clapping as the king arrived with Camilla, the queen consort. This is an altogether more solemn occasion. We are awaiting Lord Lieutenant of County Down, Gone Rowan Hamilton.
an interesting individual in uh, his own right. Gordon Rowan Hamilton is a man who actually does live in a castle because some people would say that Hillsborough Castle is not a castle. Well, it's yes. a very elegant Georgian mansion, but it doesn't have the turrets of, of Killilay Castle, which is uh, a place on the shores of Strangford Lock, which you could really uh, fit into a sort of Disneyland-style brochure, I think, if you wanted to. There will be people in this room thinking of Her Majesty the Queen, who would have worked very closely with her. One of them, Viscount Brookborough, Lord Lieutenant of County Fermanagh. He was personal Lord in waiting to Her Majesty the Queen since 1997. One of two Lords of Waiting, not to be mistaken in any way as akin to a lady in waiting. The, the role of Lord in waiting is to step in for the Queen during state visits as. Dignitaries and world leaders are moving from one meeting to the other, whether it's the airport to the palace or from a function to Downing Street, etc. It was um, Viscount Brookborough who would travel with them. He escorted President Obama, Trump and Vladimir Putin back in 2003. And he is as discreet as you might imagine him to be about the conversations that were had on their travels with those individuals. Viscount Brookborough, of course, a descendant of a former Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, uh, Lord Brookborough. His and, grandfather. Uh, uh, yes, and he, they, they still have a, a family estate in Fermanagh, um, where I believe uh, other members of the family uh, have an active interest in tourism, hosting uh, parties who are interested in fishing and country sports in that part of Northern Ireland. King Charles III is no stranger to this room. He's held annual concerts here. They haven't returned since the pandemic. <coughs> but normally there would be a grand piano in the corner, a nod to the great music that has been enjoyed here over the centuries. And since historic royal palaces took over the running of Hillsborough Castle, they have done a huge amount of work bringing it back to its former grandeur. I think before that work began, most people would have admitted that this room had become a little tired, but being sensitive to the existing colour scheme and feeling in the room, they have done a magnificent job in restoring it. The restoration was signed off and the castle reopened by the then Prince of Wales in 2019. <coughs> the Lord Lieutenant of Down. And what we are expecting now is the Speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly, Alex Maskey, to take to his feet and give a message of condolence. King Charles, during this period of public mourning for Queen Elizabeth, we are mindful that you and your family grieve on the passing of a mother, a grandmother and a great-grandmother. I hope that you and your family can take comfort from the appreciation and the warmth that has accompanied the tributes to the Queen from across these islands and indeed across the world. I would like to sympathise with you at this difficult time. On the walls of Parliament buildings of Stormont, there are images from two of Queen Elizabeth's visits, the first during the coronation tour in 1953 and the second for the Diamond Jubilee in 2012. It's extraordinary to consider how much social and political change Queen Elizabeth witnessed in the time between those visits and indeed throughout her long reign. Yesterday, an assembly of unionists, republicans, nationalists and those for whom the constitution is not a main focus united to pay tribute to the late Queen. When she first came to the throne, no one would have anticipated an assembly so diverse and inclusive. Nor, I imagine, would it have been contemplated that someone from my own background and political tradition would be in this position 
front of you today as Speaker. We can, of course, never forget that over the last decades, too many have experienced tragedy and sorrow which will never leave them. And we have to understand that there are those for whom our political process has not yet been enough to ease their hurt and their pain. Thankfully, with the Good Friday Agreement and other significant developments, in that time we have also seen great efforts to build a peace for the future, as painstaking and frustrating as it may at times be. Queen Elizabeth was not a distant observer in the transformation and progress of relationships in and between these islands. She personally demonstrated how individual acts of positive leadership can help break down barriers and encourage reconciliation. Queen Elizabeth showed that a small but significant gesture, a visit, a handshake, crossing the street or speaking a few words of Irish can make a huge difference in changing attitudes and building relationships. Her recognition of both the British and Irish traditions, as well as the wider diversity of our community, was exceptionally significant. In all of this, she personally underlined that one tradition is not diminished by reaching out to show respect to another. Of course, such acts of leadership do not come without risks or the need for courage and determination to see them through. We are thankful for Queen Elizabeth's commitment and encouragement to building peace and reconciliation across these islands, and indeed for all of those who seek to keep us moving towards that goal. With the Queen Consort at your side, you now lead an institution with a long history and tradition. I represent the elected assembly of a society which has struggled with the legacy of our past and how to move on from it without leaving those who have suffered behind. During her visit to Dublin, Queen Elizabeth said that whatever life throws at us, our individual responses will be all the stronger for working together and sharing that load. Let us all pay heed to that. As we remember Queen Elizabeth's positive leadership, let us all reflect that such leadership is still needed. And let us be honest with ourselves enough to recognise that too often that leadership has been lacking when it has been most required. I want to acknowledge that your own words and actions over the years have already shown that you are seized of the importance of reconciliation and are committed to playing your full part in that. The challenge for all of us now is to renew the work that you and the late Queen Elizabeth have already done, and the responsibility on all of us is to work together to build a future for our whole community. In the time ahead, we will, of course, focus on that at the future, uh, the, the, on our future at the start of this new era. However, the next few days will rightly be focused on a family, a nation, and a world paying its respects and saying goodbye to Queen Elizabeth. Yesterday in Parliament buildings, members expressed their condolences and sentiments of those they represent in our community. The thoughts and the prayers of the Assembly are with you and your family in your grief. Our ESJ Guru Ahanam, may she rest in peace. My lords, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of all my family, I can only offer the most heartfelt thanks for your condolences. I am here today at a time of great personal sorrow as we mark the death of my beloved mother after a life most faithfully dedicated to the duty to which she had been called. It is fitting that uh, we should meet at Hillsborough, which my mother knew so well, and in whose beautiful rose garden she always took such pleasure. In the years since she began her long life of public service, my mother saw Northern Ireland pass through momentous uh, and historic changes. Through all those years, she never ceased to pray for the best of times for this place and its people, whose stories she knew, whose sorrows our family had felt, and for whom she had a great affection and regard. 
My mother felt deeply, I know, the significance of the role she herself played in bringing together those whom history had separated and in extending a hand to make possible the healing of long-held hurts. At the very beginning of her life of service, the Queen made a pledge to dedicate herself to her country and her people and to maintain the principles of constitutional government. This promise she kept uh, with steadfast faith. Now, with that shining example before me, and with God's help, I take up my new duties resolved to seek the welfare of all the inhabitants of Northern Ireland. During the years of my mother's reign, it has been a privilege to bear witness to such a devoted life. May it be granted to us all to fulfil the tasks before us so well. King Charles and the Queen Consort make their way through the assembled guests in the throne room to their next business. Uh, they'll soon join assembled guests who will move to the drawing room. Uh, let's discuss for a moment or two what we've just heard both from His Majesty and from the Speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly. With me now our Professor Margaret O'Callaghan, a historian and political scientist at Queen's University Belfast, and Lord Hayne, who, as Peter Hayne, was Secretary of State for Northern Ireland from May 2005 to June 2007. Welcome to both of you. I think we're all still coming to terms, Peter, with what we've just witnessed. It's quite remarkable to see Alex Maskey in his capacity as Speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly, delivering that message of condolence to King Charles and the Queen Consort. Did you almost have to pinch yourself? Well, it was another one of those it'll never happen moments that I experienced when I helped bring under Tony Blair, Ian Paisley Sr and Martin McGuinness to share power together in 2007. And here you have a Speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly, albeit suspended, who's from a deeply Republican background, giving it the most warm and uh, welcoming embrace to King Charles III and uh, to his Queen Consort. And that would have been unthinkable even 10 years ago, let alone beforehand. So that is another step along the road to peace and reconciliation. That presumably is because of the actions and the words of Queen Elizabeth herself? Well, importantly, it's a product of both the progress that's been made in Northern Ireland, where there's the chance to actually have democratic politics replace sectarianism and bigotry and hatred, and of course the gun and the bomb, uh, and to, to start to normalize life. But it is also the fact that the Queen made some pretty courageous and important steps which could not have been anticipated and were without precedent, particularly given her family's history with the assassination of Lord Mountbatten, to whom she was very close. Mm. Margaret O'Gallan, put it into some sort of wider context for us. What have we just witnessed? Well, Alex Maskey is a very interesting figure. Um, it's at the moment, there is, as we know, no assembly functioning in Northern Ireland. It was therefore problematic how uh, the new king would be received. So it's very interesting that Maskey has gone to the lengths of putting together so carefully tailored uh, a speech on behalf of uh, the assembly. Uh, I mean, the wider context, he referred to himself. The wider context is, I suppose, 
Ireland from partition 100 years ago. It's almost 100 years since then. And what he's referred to as differing traditions. And uh, I suppose Maskey spoke about the fact that in 1960, one or two, when uh, Elizabeth's the, the first uh, evidence of her being in Northern Ireland within Stormont was present, uh, he, he just said, just look at the changes. Who could have imagined that given the kind of sectarian society Northern Ireland was in the 60s, you could have an assembly so diverse today. So the wider context is partition. I Peter, suppose. it's very interesting to hear Alex Maskey talking there about the positive leadership demonstrated by Queen Elizabeth and making the point that we need to see more of that to, to deal with the current political hiatus in Northern Ireland. He also, interestingly, people will have noted, spoke Irish on two occasions in his comments, and that seemed to be very warmly uh, responded to by King Charles. It was, and it's again a, a small but important sign of progress, because not so long ago that would have been unthinkable again. It, it's a sign that you know, there's still a lot a lot of work to do, a lot of problems, a lot of sectarianism still there, the peace walls still in Belfast and so on. But um, that was another signal that people are beginning to accept each other a little more. Mm -hmm. Progress has been made. We'll speak to you again in a moment or two, but for now, thank you very much. Let's hear from some of the King's younger subjects in Northern Ireland, some of those lucky enough to have spent time with him. Obviously, there's a sad circumstance because the Queen was absolutely amazing for the nation as a whole. But yeah, I think he'll fill her shoes well. When I met uh, King Charles, he took a real liking to us. Stood, chatted away for a good 10, 15 minutes. It was mind blown at the time, especially being that young. I was about 10 or 11, and it was the, I'm standing in awe kind of thing. You hear about princes in the movies and stuff. But um, whenever you meet them in real life, uh, it's, they're very like dead on. They just walk about in their suits. You know, they're not these big in their robes and they're they're going about and touching everyone on the head and doing that kind of thing. So he was very very normal, and I think that struck me. And um, I suppose that was maybe one of my earliest political situations, you could say. It was thrilled to meet the now king and queen consort. I think it's interesting that Charles will become the new king, given that I think he was a bit more outspoken than the Queen on certain issues such as climate change. I hope he'll reach out to young people and speak to them more because I think sometimes young people's voices are lost whenever this kind of thing happens. They were visiting Kilkeel and there was a delegation from some of the local schools. Obviously there was the hype and the build up and we were standing in a line and I was speaking to my friend to the left and I turned around and he was right beside me. So I was kind of caught a bit off guard. And he asked me, do you play hockey? And I was like, no, no, I'm a cricket player and didn't have a lot of time to talk, but he was very friendly. It's a much different Britain than it was when his mother took over, but how he can make it relevant for young people and keep it up to date. That's it. That's uh, rather him than me. Let's cross back to Hillsborough Castle now, where the King will soon join a reception for assembled guests. Declan Harvey and Mark Devonport are there. Welcome to the State Drawing Room at Hillsborough Castle. Clearly the atmosphere inside the castle has relaxed somewhat after the solemn messages or message of condolence and the response from King Charles III. But this is a room, quite a large room, but certainly underlines what has been said about Hillsborough Castle, that it has a homely atmosphere. As you walk around the state drawing room, there's soft furnishings, there's photo frames, with relaxed photos of the royal family in them. Just in the center of your screen there at the back, you might be able to see on the wall, there's a, a portrait of the king by Belfast-born artist Gareth Reed. It was unveiled during a visit to the castle in 2019 following the 20 million pound renovation project. The painting shows the now king relaxing in a garden chair. 
And at the time of the unveiling, the king admitted that he always gets a bit nervous before removing the curtain and seeing a portrait. But he was reassured and he reassured Gareth Reed that when he saw the piece, he liked it and he gave it a nod of approval. I'm still joined by the BBC's former political editor in Northern Ireland, Mark Devonport. Lots of recognisable faces here waiting to greet the King and the Queen Consort. Um, yes, we're seeing um, some of the uh, politicians. Michelle O'Neill, who's uh, Sinn Féin's vice president and their Stormont leader, leader of the largest party at Stormont, will be first minister if we do have the formation of a Northern Ireland executive, uh, given the current arithmetic. Also, um, Jane Brady, I see there, who is the head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service, um, mingling with other politicians. I've seen uh, Jim Allister, who is a traditional unionist, uh, Doug Beatty from the Ulster Unionists, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson and Naomi Long, and Matthew O'Toole, who is a representative of the Nationalist SDLP, but interestingly has a background as a civil servant who worked for David Cameron in Downing Street. So he's had a, a, a very sort of interesting journey through politics. But this room is a room which is normally set out as a, a, a sitting room, a drawing room with comfy chairs around. They've been pushed away to allow so many people to mingle in there, but it's certainly more informal, as you say, than the throne room where everybody seemed to be a little bit tense waiting for the proceedings to get underway. Those who remember the Anglo-Irish agreement between Margaret Thatcher and then Irish Taoiseach Prime Minister Gareth Fitzgerald will have seen images from this very room. This is where it was signed and it was such an important step along the the, 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 the journey of Northern Irish politics. Uh, that, that was a very important step in terms of British-Irish cooperation signed by Garrett Fitzgerald, the then Taoiseach, and Margaret Thatcher. But, of course, it, it was, again, one of those points where you don't necessarily take everybody along with you because unionists were enraged about the Irish uh, consultation in the affairs of Northern Ireland and the streets of Hillsborough at that time would have been packed with anti-Anglo-Irish agreement uh, protesters. Uh, whilst this is obviously... A formal occasion, this particular room has hosted some quite informal occasions. I think of the time when Mo Molan was the Secretary of State. One, of, one, of, the more colourful, one of the more colourful Secretaries of State. She had very many celebrity uh, visitors, including in this room, um, uh, and she uh, would have had uh, parties here and spilling out onto the terrace, and maybe we'll see some of the guests making their way out onto the terrace later. But she writes in her memoirs about, for instance, having the entire cast of the Rocky Horror Picture Show um, in uh, this room, I think, and uh, it became almost a reenactment of the musical, I think, the party that uh, took place there. She also talks about the Reverend Richard Coles playing the piano, which I think has been pushed to the corner of the room at the moment. We were kindly given a walk through this room a little earlier, and at, uh, at the piano in the corner, we couldn't help have a peep at what music was sitting on the piano. It's uh, in the gloaming was the sheet music. The French windows on the other side of the room are used by the royal family to step out onto the south terrace during garden parties that are held here. There are around 100 acres of gardens and grounds around the castle, but in fact, the original Hill family had much more extensive grounds. They were one of the largest landowners on the island. Their estates ran from north of Belfast in Larne to south of Dublin in Dunleary, around 115,000 acres. And although all the members of the royal family have been here from time to time for public events, it's understood that they quite regularly visit for private weekends, including the king and the queen consort. He's said to have enjoyed painting in the gardens. He's an avid watercolorist, and some of the pieces hanging on the wall in the state drawing room were painted by the king. There's actually a very interesting collection of artwork there because obviously some of it reflects the royal connections of Hillsborough Castle, as you say, the picture of the, the king, and there's also a picture of uh, his mother when she was uh, much younger. Uh, but in an anteroom known as the Lady Grey Study, which is just off to the area that we're looking at now where the guests are visiting, there's a collection of political art, uh, the likes of Martin McGuinness, Jerry Adams, Ian Paisley, pictured there. And many of the works of art that are on display are actually 
works of art in preparation for uh, finished works that are uh, being shown elsewhere. And one test the, paintings, Test sense. paintings, if you like. And one of the sort of principles behind that exhibition uh, is that art, like politics, is all about lengthy preparation and um, uh, you don't necessarily uh, jump to the final work uh, overnight. So I think that that's deliberate on the part of the historic royal palaces to give you that kind of mixture of politics and preparation. The Queen first visited Hillsborough Castle in 1945 as a princess and this room, we're told, is decorated in colours favoured by her mother, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. And the Queen Mother's links to Hillsborough Castle were also significant. If you follow the family tree, it was her sister, Lady Rose Bowes Lyon, who married the Earl of Granville, who was governor of Northern Ireland from 1945 to 52. Hillsborough Castle at the time was the governor's official residence. So clearly the couple lived here and it was then that the Queen first came to stay with her aunt, essentially in 1945. Today visitors can enjoy the elegant Granville Garden developed by Lady Granville and in fact the monarch's seat in the state dining room which is on the other side of the castle we're told it's been positioned specifically so that the sovereign can see out over the Granville Garden and enjoy it during dinner. Should be fair to say, Mark, the room has probably never looked this good in recent times because whilst this was a, a government building, these were the rooms where negotiations were being hammered out, where people were taking a breather, where long nights were spent sometimes in fraught debate. Um, that's true. At the moment, um, Hillsborough Castle is run by historic royal palaces who have done a, a marvellous sort of renovation job and opened it out to the public and you can get tours through. But previously, it was very much a working uh, building for the Northern Ireland office and hosted many negotiations and packed in uh, very many delegates from the different parties who would be chewing over matters like paramilitary disarmament or whether justice powers should be moved from London to Northern Ireland and whilst those negotiations went on through the night uh, you would have some very unusual scenes of people sleeping in corridors sleeping in the royal bedrooms and so on now uh, we see uh, the monarch coming in to greet the visitors and also the Queen Consort Camilla shaking hands there with I think Viscount Brookborough We understand the Queen Consort will walk one side of the room, His Majesty the King the other, the King being accompanied by Chris Eaton harris the new Secretary of State, who, of course, as we've said, can also call Hillsborough Castle his official residence. It's an interesting position for Chris Heaton Harris to be in because he's just been appointed by Northern Ireland, uh, by, by Liz Truss as Northern Ireland Secretary just a week ago, and so in some ways he's showing uh, King Charles around this house. But King Charles actually knows the house probably rather better than Chris Heaton Harris, given that he's got a long uh, history of involvement. Also, um, part of the new Northern Ireland office team, we have Steve. Baker, who is the Minister of State, who was a central player in the whole uh, Brexit drama, and he is now um, uh, on the shoulder of Camilla, the Queen Consort, showing her around the, the, the guests and introducing her. Among those meeting the King will be the current Chief Constable of the Police Service of Northern Ireland, Simon Brown, and one of Northern Ireland's most well-known Olympians, I think that's fair to say, Lady Mary Peters, who just a couple of weeks ago celebrated 50 years since winning gold in the pentathlon in Munich. This room was originally designed as a library, but the books, the entire collection, was sold off at auction in 1906. We have no idea where they've ended up. But a lot of the historical family documents of the Hill family, their paperwork, accounts, plans, letters, they all survive in Northern Ireland's public record office. Thought to be as many as 50,000 documents tracking the long story of Hillsborough Castle. 
We're told it takes 300 boxes to hold all the records. There's another remarkable story about this room and how it now benefits from renovations because it was utterly destroyed in a fire in 1934. It gutted the building, but that was turned into an opportunity by those in charge to improve some of the spaces. It's believed the fire was started in the roof by a lit cigarette discarded by a careless guard who was lowering the flag to acknowledge the death of President Hindenburg of Germany. But clearly, that catastrophe gave way to what are now stunning state rooms and apartments. Obviously, my um, speciality has been in more recent politics, but you mentioned Wills Hill, the um, owner, original owner of Hillsborough Castle, and um, he had uh, political meetings here going back into the 18th century, famously hosted Benjamin Franklin. There, uh, there are differing accounts of how well they did or did not uh, get on, but it's fair to say that so far as uh, the British monarchy was concerned and King George III, that didn't end very well because he was the Secretary of State for the American colonies and of course the American colonies went their own way. The Speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly, Alex Maskey, in conversation with the Queen Consort. And Michelle O'Neill, Vice President of Sinn Féin, the party's northern leader, and since the last election in May, the first minister-designate of Northern Ireland, leader of the largest party here. You can see that big row of medals there on the chest of Doug Beatty, the leader of the Ulster Unionists, and that reflects the fact that he was a soldier in the Royal Irish Rangers and saw active service, uh, was involved in very many uh, fights for survival in Afghanistan. And now Camilla has moved on to chat uh, with Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, the leader of the DUP, a uh, member of the Privy Council. They may well have met before, I'm sure, uh, that uh, King Charles has met uh, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson before. And um, just beside uh, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson is Naomi Long, who's the uh, leader of the Alliance Party. Here we move to uh, King Charles, talking to guests on the other side of the drawing room. As member of the Privy Council, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson was at St James's Palace for the proclamation there. And this is Naomi Long, leader of the Alliance Party, which sits outside the traditional binary look at politics here. Just um, There was a reference there in Alex Maskey's message uh, where he said he was delivering a message on behalf of Unionist Nationalists and Republicans and also uh, those for whom the Constitution is not their main focus and uh, that was really a reference to a reference to the Alliance Party um, who uh, say that they want to make Northern Ireland work and if you like save decisions about whether it should be British or Irish for later. representatives of the armed forces, joined by the Chief Constable Simon Byrne. And this is a space that the King will feel very relaxed in, has been here many times for public events and as we've said, private weekends, a home away from home. <laughs> I've been told on previous visits here that he takes uh, a very detailed interest in Hillsborough Castle and how it looks, not just what kind of artwork there is on the walls, but obviously with his interest in horticulture, he's very interested in the gardens and what the look of the, uh, the, the castle should be outside. And we understand that, as he has done many times previously, the King will make his way towards the French doors, which are currently to his right. And he's expected to step outside and speak to members of 206 Ulster Battery Royal Artillery. 
they have been firing the gun salutes here at Hillsborough over the last few days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and again today. Clearly a relaxed atmosphere in this room, which will be in stark contrast to the more solemn service we're expecting at St. Anne's Cathedral in Belfast City Centre a little later. And Mark, politically, quite a moment, isn't it? it when you see representatives from the nationalist side of politics in a room greeting the new monarch. Um, it's a, yet another symbol of how far things have changed in Northern Ireland. That you have um, almost all shades of opinion uh, represented there. Now, of course, this is still a, a process which is in development. And just a few days ago, Sinn Féin made it clear that they weren't go, going to attend the accession uh, uh, ceremony because they saw that as being a ceremony for those who showed allegiance to the British Crown. But they were happy to attend this function because they believed it was all about passing on a personal message of condolence or a, uh, a message of condolence from the Assembly um, to uh, King Charles. And here we see those who've been involved um, in the military side of the set ceremonies uh, waiting to, to meet the monarch on the steps at the back of Hillsborough Castle. Very lovely grounds, these. A dedicated team of 16 gardeners and volunteers work continuously on the gardens the enormous gardens at Hillsborough Castle, very beautiful gardens too. And as we've said, on private weekends, the king is thought to enjoy painting in those grounds. The 206 Ulster Battery Royal Artillery, members of which have been mobilised to support the regular army on a number of different operations with soldiers having served in Iraq, Afghanistan, Cyprus, Canada, Kosovo and Bosnia. And on a beautiful day in County Down, it, it would be hard to find a more lovely corner than the South Terrace of Hillsborough Castle familiar to anyone who has been at one of the garden parties here <laughs> and so enjoyed by secretaries of state for Northern Ireland who get to have it all to themselves. That's the difference these days that now that historic royal palaces are involved there's a more regular um, opening out of the grounds to the public than would have been possible of course. I think um, Mo Molan writing in her memoir said that she was keen to open up the castle more but there were always security fears um, at that particular time and it's only been more recently that it's been turned over if you like to a sort of more commercial existence although those grounds that we were looking at there have been used regularly for gardens parties with the Queen or other senior members of the royal family in attendance um, and um, many a function has been held there. As we said there's almost a hundred acres of grounds around the castle and leading right up to that portico is what's known as Yew Tree Walk. It's beautiful now it is in fact the old road out of Royal Hillsborough towards the uh, nearby village of Moira. <coughs> but as these things go, the house was expanded. They needed a nicer garden, so the road to Moira was diverted to allow Yew Tree Walk to impress. And these two gentlemen who we just saw talking to Camilla are the two representatives of the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church in Inniskillen, where in 2012, the Queen walked across the road from one to the other, and the symbolism of that wasn't lost on anyone. They described a conversation with the Queen as having been like scolded by your grandmother because she directly asked them, what are you doing on a daily basis to help the communities in Northern Ireland 
come together. And they took it on board, and lots has been done since then and continues to be done. A joint service will be held in the next few days to remember and pay tribute to Queen Elizabeth II. Back outside in the sunshine, Prince Charles continuing uh, to talk to uh, some more of his visitors. Um, we were talking earlier on about uh, the fact that this was one of the first places that his mother visited uh, because her aunt was in residence as the, the wife of the uh, Northern Ireland governor. And it was clearly a place uh, that she always had a very special uh, place in her heart for because it was, um, I think, the first time that she took an aeroplane after World War II. It obviously wouldn't have been safe during wartime but they took a flight across and they came to visit and she came back within a year entirely on her own obviously enjoyed so much the time that she had here and during uh, that uh, visit which was I think in 1946 she actually uh, went to a small town in Northern Ireland elsewhere in County Down Cumber and attended a christening where she acted as godmother to one of her best friends who was a, a lady in waiting uh, for the uh, palace and I think uh, also had a role here at the Hillsborough Castle residence. The boys' brigade, the girls' brigade, girl guiding, the scouts all well represented here at Hillsborough Castle. And what's been startling about the scenes we've seen at Royal Hillsborough since Thursday is the amount of younger people who have come, who've wanted to be involved, who've wanted to pay tribute. On Thursday night, late into the night, it was dark up at Royal Hillsborough. The rain was coming down in sheets, but there were groups of teenagers coming up in the early stages of that carpet of flowers we now see outside Hillsborough Castle. But they were coming up in small groups, standing in silence. That's um, Peter Kyle, uh, the uh, Shadow Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Labour's uh, point person on Northern Ireland, having a word, I think, uh, with King Charles. And King Charles moving down now uh, to meet members of the military. In advance of the arrival this morning, some of the groups gathering outside, there was a, a group of three older ladies who had left their nursing home this morning at 5 a.m. to be here and get a front seat row out the front of Hillsborough Castle in order to see King Charles and the Queen Consort. They said it was sad to be here, but the word they used was also very uplifting. And we've definitely seen that Two hundred six Ulster Battery of the Royal Artillery, who we understand, as we say, had requested if they could meet King Charles the Third here at Hillsborough. going to leave those pictures of King Charles talking to those responsible for delivering that 21-gun salute on his arrival earlier this afternoon and uh, we'll come back to Hillsborough for the departure of the King and the Queen Consort but with me in the studio still the historian Professor Margaret O'Callaghan from Queen's University in Belfast and the former Secretary of State Lord Hain. Um, we were just watching with interest the warmth in the room during that reception, Peter, I think it's fair to say. A lot of politicians there, representatives of Sinn Féin. We know that Alex Maskey, the Republican who was interned, who was a member of the IRA back in the 1970s, speaking on behalf of the people of Northern Ireland, representing all of the parties in that message of condolence to the King on the loss of his mother, Queen Elizabeth II. And in that lineup to meet the King and the Queen Consort, he was standing beside Michelle O'Neill, who's the First Minister designate. And then alongside them, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, the leader of the DUP, Doug Beatty, former British soldier, of course, with his medals on his chest, uh, leader of the Ulster Unionist Party. Um, quite an interesting mix of people and really 
a fascinating event we've just witnessed. It is, and seeing Hillsborough Castle in its glory, having stayed there, the official residence of the Secretary of State for over two years and spent some happy times there and some tough times negotiating too, it was really nice to see it. And of course it's also the official residence of the, the monarch when they're in situ and there is the, now the King's bedroom uh, and the Consort's bedroom alongside each other uh, on the first floor. But, you know, <laughs> again, it's this giant stride it's very frustrating, as I'm sure Margaret will say, for Northern Ireland citizens to have their parliament, their legislature suspended and this, this kind of standoff as a result of the DUP stunts. But it's nevertheless light years away from where it was and it's another sign of progress today and it's interesting how King Charles and, and Queen Consort Camilla have helped nudge it along that road. Yes, Margaret, just briefly, we don't want to become too dewy-eyed about this because while that is significant, there are still huge political challenges mm. in Northern Ireland at the moment. There is no functioning government. There are enormous political challenges. The whole situation on the protocol is unclear. Uh, the new appointments to uh, by Liz Trust, we don't know how they're going to pan out and probably won't know for a while. So politically, things are deeply unstable. What's quite interesting is that Sinn Féin have chosen to play a role of actually stabilising government in Northern Ireland by the extent to which they have stepped up to the plate and been representative of the institutions in, um, in acknowledging uh, you know, the sorrow of people across the board in Northern Ireland on the death of the Queen. That's pretty interesting, I think. Just to bring you up to date with what's happening at Royal Hillsborough, the King uh, has just left his invited guests. Uh, with security issues still a concern on any royal visit, a glimpse or perhaps a brief handshake is often all any member of the public might hope for. Changed times, perhaps, from the Queen's visit to Northern Ireland on her coronation tour way back in 1953. Then, one man at least got up close to the young Queen, and it's him we have to thank for capturing that visit in glorious colour. Harold Patterson's daughter explains now how her father managed to film such remarkable footage. It's hard to know where Dad got his love for filming from. He was only 23 and he was a shopkeeper in Lisburn selling farm goods. But he was a keen filmmaker and he was part of the local photography club. It was very significant for Dad that the Queen came to Lisburn, his hometown. It was a big deal. He was a country boy and this was a momentous occasion for him and I think all of those things were what motivated him to really do his best to seek her out and to work with the photography club to get these shots. It was just an opportunity of a lifetime. Dad was fortunate that he knew the local county inspector and he was given a permission slip which said that he was to be granted access to a reasonable extent. Reasonable extent was handwritten in. And we often joked as a family and teased Dad and said, well, you really did take you know, an unreasonable extent because he got so close. It's easy to take colour for granted nowadays, isn't it? I look back and see then similar footage at the time being in black and white. And then I look at Dad's footage it does bring it so much more alive and you just feel the whole sense and smell of that period and the clothing and the weather and just everything seems so much more alive. Dad was probably aware that it was a really unique opportunity and I think he did, yes, just go for it and think, well, I'm, I'm going to see what I can get away with. And I think those of us that knew Dad, I think he, he often showed that sort of, you know, cheekiness and perkiness about him. He did say that it was a completely mad day, going to the airport and flying up and trying to get... I mean, Dad loved that. He, he had a real sense of passion for... He loved a good challenge. Uh, you just imagine him absolutely loving trying to get through the crowds and trying to find where to park the car and where to get out. So he would have been in his element. He said he didn't expect to get such 
good footage. But somehow, you know, nobody bat an eyelid when he got in close and I think he did realise, well, you know, the Queen has just come here to Northern Ireland, to my hometown, Lisburn. I'm, I'm going to be there and I'm going to capture this moment. It was amazing what he managed to achieve. Just absolutely remarkable uh, footage captured there in 1953 by Harold Patterson. Uh, it takes you back. It's as if you're there, isn't it? It's, it's Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting that it is, of course, Lisburn, loyal Lisburn, which was loyal then and is loyal now. And it's also quite interesting that people don't seem to fly um, Union Jacks in such proliferation as they do today. Yeah. It's quite an interesting change. It's not the kind of change we normally emphasise. But I suppose a lot of these royal events show us there's a kind of invention of tradition going on, like at all stages. So we see all of this as the past and history and tradition, but actually the traditions are being added to all the time. Peter, interesting because of course that was 1953, the Queen's first visit to Northern Ireland as monarch. Today we have King Charles' first visit to Northern Ireland as monarch. So there's a there's a parallel there, there's a, there's a symmetry there. She was very much at the beginning of her lengthy reign and you had some dealings with her um, in, in later years. I think it was 2007, you said you were Secretary of State in Hillsborough Castle, um, which we've been enjoying seeing the pictures of today. And you had cause to brief her in your capacity as Secretary of State. And what struck you was just how engaged she was in what was happening. Absolutely. I mean, we met uh, one, one to one, just the two of us, upstairs in the living, in the sitting room on the first floor, just along from her bedroom. And uh, my job was to just tell her where I thought things were going. This was in the months before we got the settlement. And she was very uh, interested, she was well informed. And it struck me, you know, she had to command such a, a wide breadth of issues in her job. And no doubt, because she was coming to Northern Ireland, there was extra background for her, but it was a, a really good conversation. You felt, well, you were having a conversation with somebody who really knew what, what was going on. Mm. She knew what questions to ask. Maybe that was the key. She knew what questions to ask and she listened. She's a good listener as well, which uh, uh, King Charles is too. And she has now handed on the baton to her son, the new king, and in so many respects, he has you know, real challenges to deal with. And, and that is absolutely the case in terms of the peace process in Northern Ireland, reconciliation, Anglo-Irish relations. What's your impression of how Prince Charles will deal with that challenge in the months and years ahead? I'm sure very well, because he's across the detail and he cares a lot about it. But it is, it is a difficult moment, which in a sense the the respect shown and the courtesy shown to the Queen uh, in, in, her, in her death and also to the, the new King, uh, that Northern Ireland actually, the individuals in Northern Ireland are very respectful and very courteous about their traditions. So that's what this visit's been about. But, but he, he is, he's taking the throne at a time when the politics is in a really bad state. And the peace process has stalled. Relations with Dublin, the Irish Republic, and are, after all, are joint custodians with the British government of the Good Friday peace process. Uh, those relations are pretty bad following Brexit, and he's going to find himself in the middle of all of that. Mm. Thank you. I'll come back to you both in a moment or two. I just want to pause because a major focal point of her first visit as Queen to Northern Ireland in 1953 was, of course, Belfast City Hall, and it will provide a vantage point for the citizens of Belfast as the King passes through the city shortly, and Holly Hamilton is there for us. Yes, City Hall is probably one of the most photographed buildings in Belfast now, but it's also provided a backdrop to some of the key moments in history over the years. And for many people, those old enough to remember certainly the arrival of King Charles III may bring back some memories, as you mentioned earlier, of when Her Majesty the Queen came to visit Belfast. And even then, the spectators lined the streets all the way from Queen's University down to City Hall. And yes, even 70 years on, let me tell you, the people of Northern Ireland have come out in force once again today and I'm delighted to say I'm joined by three of them who I have plucked from the crowd. I'm joined by Brenda and Frankie and Gary. Welcome along to all of you. Brenda, I'm going to start with you because we spotted you very early this morning at about eight o'clock um, and as I say the, the King hasn't arrived yet. What, what made you come out at that time? 
Ach, just we wanted to show the Keener support and just let them know the people from Northern Ireland's 100% behind him in his new role. And Frankie, I have to show this picture as well. I, I spotted this very early this morning. With King Charles III, just tell me what type of monarch you hope he'll be. Well, I hope he'll be a great monarch for um, as a king, because he has a teacher. His mother was a teacher and uh, has learned him how to do the king thing. Thank you so much to both of you. And now, Gary, you have actually met Her Majesty the Queen and the new king, Charles III. Uh, just tell me what happened. Have indeed. Uh, the first occasion to see Her Majesty, didn't meet her unfortunately, was in 2012 at Stormont uh, when she attended here to mark her Jubilee that year. And we were lots of us invited to Stormont Estate and we were right beside her when she drove past. And I'm sure a lot of people watching will remember I had a specially commissioned hat that I doffed as she passed and I shouted, Congratulations, ma'am, and well done, sir. And we could see her tapping the late Duke on the arm and they both looked round and smiled at us. And I have a wonderful photograph of that memory. And I know that you entertained King Charles. Just tell me about that. Yeah, I was honoured and privileged to be invited to uh, perform as a comedian for His Royal Highness now, His Majesty King Charles in Hillsborough Castle, indeed in the very same throne room that he has just spoken in there. And that was a very uh, awesome and amazing experience, a uh, very close encounter. And Lovely. Enjoyable. Gary, an unofficial court jester, I think it's fair <laughs> to say. It's not long to go now, of course. Um, the, the pipes are piping here now, the sun is shining and the crowds are waiting for that moment in history. And things are about to wrap up at Hillsborough Castle, where the King and Queen Consort are about to depart for the other major event in this afternoon's programme, that service of reflection at Belfast Cathedral. There are, though, just some formalities to take care of. First, the signing of the visitor's book, and Declan Harvey and Mark Devonport um, can talk us through it. Yes, there was a, a little discussion earlier about what pen would be used. Clearly, there are some leakages here. But uh, you join us in the candlestick hall. And over in the corner, a bust of Queen Elizabeth II as a princess. You see it in the background there by the sculptor Sir William Reed Dick. Yes, they've left the candlestick hall now and they're just making their way, I think, to the front of the building, through the section of the building, actually, where Tony Blair um, famously said that he felt the hand of history on his shoulder, which was a similar remark to the one made by uh, King Charles just yesterday to Parliament when he talked about feeling the weight of the events on his shoulders. For those waiting outside Hillsborough Castle, this is the last glimpse, perhaps, they will get today of the new king and the queen consort. They won't make it into Belfast city centre as quickly as the monarch will. In fact, the entire Royal Hillsborough village has been locked down for the past few days. The way of getting here is through free shuttle buses. Somebody speaking to us outside earlier said that they deeply wanted to be in London over the next few days, but the availability and price of flights and hotels was prohibitive and they were to be fair slightly intimidated by the queues that are expected for the Queen's lying in state in Westminster but this just a glimpse into the state entrance which is just next to the candlestick hall it's in the state entrance where a number of photographs of the Queen have been laid out they show her at the Giant's Causeway and also in in a skillin back in uh, 2012 and a black and white image among them as well on her first visit as monarch in 1953 no doubt as they hear the cars coming to life in the forecourt of hillsborough castle the crowds outside will know exactly what is coming bit of excitement for those waiting there have been some hardy souls there who've been uh, standing around for a long time uh, as I, uh, as you were saying earlier on uh, the earliest from 5 a.m. this morning and there were some who told me that they're planning to get on a plane and go across to London oh, and do it all over again nine hours they've been waiting outside Hillsborough Castle
So King Charles and Camilla, the Queen Consort, step through the state entrance. Laura McCurry, who's the head of Hillsborough Castle, and Gone Rowan Hamilton, the Lieutenant, County Down, bid farewell to them. They take up their places in the rear of uh, the royal car. Peter Hayne and Margaret O'Callaghan are with me. Um, you must have welcomed a lot of people and said goodbye to a lot of people on those very steps, Peter. Indeed, including Her Majesty the Queen. And so they're driving out now. It's what is interesting about Hillsborough Castle. It doesn't have any ramparts or turrets or anything like that. It's, it's a stately home, essentially. But it's right in the middle of Hillsborough Village. So they'll go out down Hillsborough High Street, which is a kind of picture postcard mm. little town, uh, and then, then be off. And the villagers always give you a, a great welcome if you wander down the street with your protection officers in tow as Secretary of State. Or at least I did. You know, you get a, you get a great welcome from people. It was, of course, bought, wasn't it, by the um, government of Northern Ireland for the governor. It was in uh, the early 1920s. But now we see people, what, coming out. And the the, the governor, of course, um, at a time was married to the to the Queen's aunt, so she was a frequent visitor. Uh, we can see there uh, the Royal Motorcade making its way down Main Street, and uh, lots of people have stayed during the visit. Um, to, to, to get a second glimpse of the King. I suppose the connections between the British aristocracy, the royal family and a lot of these houses of Ulster are quite interesting. Yes. And this is, if you like, a vignette of uh, the network of connections. And you could see a lot of those connections in the room at the meeting today. There were all um, kinds could. of individuals it's... with all sorts of, of So there's a kind of hidden history. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's a lot of history and a lot of uh, decorative art there, but it's also, interestingly, when you stay at it, it's quite homely. You, you, over Christmas... It's comfortable. It's yeah. comfortable. You have your family traditionally come and join you. And that's a lovely shot, uh, a high shot of the village of Hillsborough as the uh, motorcade makes its way from Hillsborough Castle. Uh, the King, of course, now on his way to... Belfast Cathedral, St Anne's Cathedral, as it's known in the city, for a service of reflection on the life of Queen Elizabeth II. On the way, the King and Queen Consort will pass Belfast City Hall. We heard from Holly Hamilton a few moments ago there. Lots of people have gathered. The King isn't stopping, uh, but he will drive past, and obviously people are there and want to, uh, to pay their respects to him. We'll pick up those pictures as the King and his motorcade arrive in Belfast. But as sovereign, the Queen was defender of the faith and supreme governor of the Church of England. Indeed, faith and respect for the faith of others was a matter of great importance to her. In June 2012, she visited Enniskillen in Northern Ireland, following a meeting in the Anglican Cathedral there with survivors of the 1987 Remembrance Day bombing in the town. The Queen crossed the street and entered St Michael's Church. It was the first time the Queen had set foot in a Catholic church in Northern Ireland. Two clergymen involved in that historic moment now reflect on the significance of that act. There are certain things that the Queen does every day, every year, and then there are certain things she does only once, and this was one of those things she did only once. I certainly felt it was a tremendous acknowledgement because, you know, Kenny and I took a bit of a risk in doing what we did. It was a step into the unknown, and uh, I suppose there was a degree of fear of how community would react to somebody who would be deemed as the Protestant faith going to the Roman Catholic faith. Here was an event where the Queen of England was coming into a Roman Catholic church. Uh, it was a big deal in lots of different respects. And if you're strong, everybody's strong in themselves, within their own faith, within their own political views, whatever it may be, you're untinted by just crossing a street, mingling and mixing, showing tolerance and respect and understanding with each other. There was a moment in which everybody could rejoice, but inevitably you're skating along the edge of a lot of history there, and certainly that's how it felt for me. I thought she was an immensely centred person, and I thought to myself, what kind of person are you 
that you can do this. She's obviously a deeply spiritual lady and she didn't seem to have a problem with this outreach to show that we were one community together here under God. This lady comes across to me as an immensely Christian person and she certainly served us here that day. We're not trying to erase the past, we can't do that. And it's, it was like a royal seal of approval that she gave for us working together and uh, the legacy will live on. Well, joining me now in the studio is Father Brian Darcy, priest, writer and broadcaster, and the recipient of an OBE for his work in building cross-community relations in Northern Ireland. Alongside him is the very Reverend John Mann, a former Dean of Belfast. Welcome to both of you. It's Thank uh, you very lovely much indeed. to have you here. Um, I assume you've been watching carefully, and Dean Mann in particular, looking forward to the service in the cathedral. It will be a sombre occasion, of yes. course, and rightly so. But that is a building and a congregation you know very well. It's, oh yes, the building is very familiar to me, and, uh, and indeed uh, the service. Uh, I, I, I know what is about to, to happen. And uh, I, I think it will be a very Im important and very reflective service, and one that I think people will feel really a part of when they're watching it. Mm. Mm. Uh, we've had so many different aspects to today's proceedings, Father Brian. We have reflected and will continue to reflect on the contribution made <coughs> by Her Majesty during her long reign, but also looking ahead to the challenges facing the new monarch, King Charles. Um, and then there's been the, the pure enjoyment that we've seen on the faces of the people who've met the King and Queen Consort. Yeah, all of those things are very much part of it. I'm still a bit sad uh, with, with the death of Her Majesty. Uh, she was a, a lovely person to meet and uh, a very religious person, very very uplifting person. Anytime we meet, I was there, there at the Inn in Eskillen, I was there in the congregation and she whispered to me that uh, what you just said, this is the first time I've been in the Catholic Church in Ireland. I was quite shocked about that. It, 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 I'm sure when I thought about it, it was great. But she was quite delighted to be there and it was quite significant. I mean, she didn't do it just as walking across the street sort of thing. It was it was a little more than that. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it did help to bring people together Together. It did help. I mean, I've been working in Inniskillen since 1990, uh, just immediately after the bombing, and it, it has been very difficult to get people to come together. But Inniskillen has led the way there and, and uh, has done a lot for it. That was a very significant gesture on her part, one of many we've discussed on our yeah. coverage today. I, I wanted to talk to you about your relationship with the Queen because I know you met her on a number of occasions. Mm. And in fact, you were surprised, I think, to get a phone call inviting you to lunch. And during that lunch, you sat beside her and you talked about her. Christian faith during that meeting. She, I think, asked you for some advice. Yes, it was very much, I was quite surprised, quite shocked by it, actually. And I thought somebody was taking a hand out of me by phoning me. And I said, phone me back tomorrow morning. And then they did phone back and uh, Alan Brooke phoned me to say, no, it's not a joke, Brian, this is the real thing. Uh, and uh, I, I was, I didn't say why it should be, but I was over there and she knew she knew that my name and my work from listening to Terry Wogan. She was a big, big Terry Wogan fan and she listened to Pause for Thought, which I've been on for with Terry for 18 years at that stage. And she just knew some of the things I was saying. So I was sitting directly for the entire lunch at that day. It was a very small lunch. The Duke of Edinburgh was uh, across the way. Um, and I could hardly get a word in edge, as I'm delighted to say. I was I was so honoured. And she was full of faith, full of prayer. She was told me other Catholic um, ministers and one cardinal in particular, whom she was very, very fond of and took great spiritual uh, assist from. And she talked about reading the Psalms each day and she was asking me what sort of prayer I had. And she said then she wanted to know about uh, family and her Christmas message and you know the, she wanted to ensure that there was a very strong Christian message in her Christmas Day uh, talk to the nation and she was very much part of that. Just briefly Dean Mann for now, yes. none of that will come as a surprise to you. You are absolutely mm -hmm. convinced about the importance of uh, the Queen's Christian faith to her. Oh yes, her, her devotional life and her, her sense of, of calling I think are you know absolutely crucial. Um, I, I think it was it was put by a writer um, in the paper over the weekend that she believed that she was called by God, um, but knew that um, she didn't um, she didn't have the rights, 
if you like, the right to, um, in, in a sense, divine um, uh, responsibility, as it were. Uh, so it, 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 it was very, very important to her, but I think in, in terms of her devotional life, um, uh, that, that love of the Book of Common Prayer, the, the beautiful prayers that she would have learned as a child, uh, and in fact two uh, elements of the Book of Common Prayer uh, will be in the service uh, today. Uh, a psalm uh, with the wording from the Book of Common Prayer and the Nunc Dimittis, this beautiful, Lord, let us thou thy servant depart in peace, uh, which, you know, is, is read at uh, funeral services uh, and is, is, will be part of this service today. Well, thank you for giving us that insight into what is to come in the service that's um, taking place at three this afternoon. Mm. Thank you both um, for now with the King. Still en route, there are about 20 minutes to go until the service of reflection begins at Belfast Cathedral. Earlier, we heard Dean Stephen Ford describe some of the preparations for the service. Now, for the first time, let's move inside and join our commentator, Seamus McKee. Belfast Cathedral. People have gathered here for over a hundred years to mark moments of celebration and of sorrow. The history of this great building spans the lifetime of Queen Elizabeth herself. Its stained glass windows bear witness to the faith that sustained her. Its walls carry memorials of the intervals of war and peace that marked her reign. Beneath these Romanesque arches, generations have come to pray and to be together, even as civil conflict raged outside in the years of Northern Ireland's troubles. Today, it is still a place of daily worship. The nave, with its long center aisle, was the first part of the cathedral to be opened. That was on the 2nd of June, 1904 before the island of Ireland was partitioned. On the 2nd of June this year, formal celebrations began for Queen Elizabeth's Platinum Jubilee. Shortly, her son and successor will join this congregation in reflection on the life of a mother and a monarch. It is from this island and beyond that the congregation is drawn. Political leaders and those prominent in civic and sporting society, alongside representatives of community groups and charities. It's an important day for Belfast. A large number of city councillors are here. Any moment now, we're expecting the Prime Minister and the Irish President. The Secretary of State has already taken his place. There's Doug Beatty, the Ulster Unionist leader, about to take his. As I say, there is a warm and cordial atmosphere about this building. There is the Lord Lieutenant, the Vice Lord Lieutenant of Belfast, I should say, Sir Nigel Hamilton, welcoming an order of the guests. The service that will begin soon has a number of elements. Coming from Belfast, it will have its own identity, reflected especially in the music that will be heard along with the prayers and readings. It will be solemn, but not mournful, as well as reflection this is a service of thanksgiving for the life and the reign of Queen Elizabeth. This then is the scene as we await the arrival of the King and the Queen Consort. Well, the royal couple are due to arrive at Belfast Cathedral very shortly. And um, we're looking at pictures there of the interior of the the building and someone who knows it very well is with me, I'm pleased to say, Dean Mann, the Reverend John Mann, who, who served as Dean um, and has just retired, in fact, not from that job, yes, but from another from job. Another, so when, yes. when you look um, back at it looking so resplendent today and you know the effort you have made to make sure that today goes smoothly by um, laying the foundation work a number of years ago, as you've said, um, you must have a sense of anticipation, but you must be pleased as well. Oh, absolutely. I think it's, it's, it is a wonderful building and it, it is wonderful for this um, particular ceremony. I think that what um, the whole 
St Anne's team, if you like, will be attempting to achieve is something that brings a sense of worship, a sense of solemnity, yes, but uh, celebration and, um, and commemoration together. And to get that, that, that mix right, I think, is, is key to this, that people can feel that they can, they can put their own reflection into, um, into what, is, um, what is happening their own memories, their own thoughts, and their own prayers. We're just seeing some VIP arrivals at the front of the building. There's Liz Truss, the Prime Minister, just being accompanied into the cathedral. We know it was announced last week that Liz Truss would attend various services of reflection with the King and Queen Consort across the United Kingdom. Today, she is in Belfast. She's just uh, coming in the West Doors, I think, uh, is the West John, Doors. the West yes, Doors, yes. the main entrance into mm. St. Anne's Cathedral, welcomed there by the Lord Lieutenant of Belfast, Dame Fenula J. O'Boyle. Yes. And of course, the, the big doors are glass, so people out in Writers Square will be able to see right into the cathedral, be able to see this, this happening. Hopefully. And they're enormous. Yeah, they are enormous, <laughs> yes. There are large doors that close over them at night, but yes, they're... Uh, the glass doors are there during the day. And that's uh, Bishop George Davidson just mm. um, speaking to her there. Yes. Uh, so Sir Nigel Hamilton, Deputy Lieutenant, uh, just greeting people at the steps as well. So she, Liz Truss making her way, presumably, up to the front yes. of the cathedral for the service. And we know that the King and the Queen Consort are on their way. They will not be too far away at this stage. Brian, of course, the interesting thing is that this is a service taking place in St. Anne's Cathedral, but it is a service for more than just the congregation of that cathedral. This is a, this is a service um, which will have many people participating in it. Um, mm. It's for the people in the church, but it's also for people listening on the radio and watching on television in Northern Ireland and beyond. Well, I, I think that's exactly what Her Majesty would want. That's exactly what she'd want. She believed in the Christian faith. And, and indeed, uh, Dean John, when he was in the cathedral, had a, 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 a more ecumenical chapter, uh, which was quite unique and quite new. I'm not sure if it still is there, but mm. uh, it was uh, uh, in his time, so that the services in St. Anne's would be far reaching and across boundaries as this will be. I mean, after all, uh, prayer is prayer and the Lord's Prayer is a prayer that we all say as Christians. Just looking at some interesting pictures, you'll recognise some of the faces there. Michael Coveney, the Republic of Ireland's yes. Minister of Foreign Affairs. Um, Michal Martin, the Michal, Taoiseach, yes. um, taking his seat at the moment anyway beside the Prime Minister. So he is the Prime Minister of the Republic of Ireland. We also saw Chris Heaton-Hill, the new Secretary of State. Um, we know that um, President Michael D. Higgins is due to be at the service today as well, and that's not insignificant. I, I think it's hugely significant, in fact, because after the Inniskillen event where the Queen went from the Anglican to the Catholic Church, sometime later, uh, the President O'Higgins came up and he did the journey in reverse. And it was also a very significant day when he went to St Michael's Force and then went to pray a longer service in St McCartan's. I think that's very important that it, that it would be there. I'm just wondering, you know, one of the... There is the President of Ireland, yes, Michael D. Higgins, exactly, just yes. um, stepping out of his car, being greeted by Bishop Davison down on the uh, on the pavement. Yes. Um, there's a lot of work. John has gone into the uh, the drawing up of this guest list. <laughs> I'm sure it has, and uh, no doubt the Northern Ireland office had its place in that. Um, but uh, yes, the the whole thing, and uh, like any event, um, does take a, a, an awful lot of uh, working through, and it, it it will have been tweaked as as the years have gone by as well. And I think there are some, some really um, beautiful things that are going to be uh, experienced. Um, and the, the whole point about reconciliation has been talked about a lot already today. Um, and I was, um, I know that, the, um, that Archbishop John is wearing his cross of nails, pectoral cross today uh, for this service. And he's chosen to uh, wear that specifically today, that sense of reconciliation that, you know, goes, it's broader than just Northern Ireland. This is, this is something that is important to all people. We need a reconciled world. 
Yeah. It's the Christian world, I think. A absolutely. And, and not just the Christian world, because no. as the King has said, he, he's, the, he's the leader of uh, and, and welcoming of all faiths. And, 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 and other faith leaders are going to be in the cathedral here. And maybe the theme of reconciliation will be very much to the fore in, in what we hear. President Michael D. Higgins and Mrs. Higgins Sabina. Um, being shown to their seats. These are live pictures of Belfast City Hall, magnificent building right in the centre of the city. And there the King's motorcade is uh, passing by. He's not stopping, but you can see that a lot of people have gathered uh, to wish him well. This is um, probably four or five minutes away from the cathedral itself. He'll come along the M1 motorway from Hillsborough and then turned into some of the smaller uh, streets, a network of streets, bringing him right into the city centre. And you can see there the police outrider. They're going at a, not surprisingly, a relatively gentle speed because the king will want people to have an opportunity yes, to yes, glimpse him yes, he and, and he will want to acknowledge the fact that people have taken the time uh, to come out to, uh, to, to, to pay their respects. Yes, I'm sure he'd love to get out and, and, and spend some time with it, but the time isn't available. It's quite remarkable how fresh and how well and enthusiastic he has been on each occasion in the midst of his own heartbreak. I think he's done magnificently here uh, and he has been uh, re re repeating services uh, which are quite similar uh, over various occasions but, he's in, but he has in maintained his enthusiasm and his gratitude. I think it shows a great deal uh, of, of uh, courage and insight on his behalf in the midst of his own grief. Yes, President Higgins installed in <coughs> his seat in the cathedral uh, and, and, and a very significant representation from uh, the Republic of Ireland, it has to be said. I mentioned the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Simon Coveney, is there. The Taoiseach, there he is, Micheál Martin, yeah, Martin, sitting alongside the Prime, Minister. the Prime Minister, Liz Truss. And um, this is an important service and a solemn service, but there's, Brian, you know, serious politics that they will have to engage in in the weeks and months ahead. We know that, and, and we can't overlook that on an occasion like this. I mean, this it means nothing really if, if that doesn't happen, because Her Majesty would want that to happen. I'm just thinking the last time in St Anne's Cathedral there was a, uh, a virus uh, funeral. Something did come out of that when the politicians were asked by the minister to get together and do something and bring us forward, and it did happen. I'm, I'm just hoping that maybe. Uh, with the power of God, something would come of today's as well. Interesting that just sitting in the row behind uh, President Higgins and uh, oh, certainly behind Prime Minister uh, Liz Truss and uh, Micheál Martin, we saw there uh, a glimpse of the head of the civil service in Northern Ireland, Jane Brady, but also uh, the leaders of the two largest parties in Northern Ireland, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson of the DUP and Michelle O'Neill of Sinn Féin. And we've been talking about just how far People across the board have been stretching themselves. Alex Maskey did. Michelle yes. O'Neill there meeting the Prince, um, taking part in this service. And I understand that uh, the Lord Mayor, the Sinn Féin Lord Mayor of Belfast yes, of and course. the Sinn Féin MP for North Belfast were also involved in the service today in, in, and will greet the King when he arrives. Um, we were saying to some of our guests earlier that was unimaginable just a few years ago. It is unimaginable and it, and it shows that politics does work, maybe not quickly enough for the rest of us on a practical level, but you know, coming together, the first step is the most difficult step and, and I think that is true of no matter where we are in reconciliation, the first step is the most difficult one and if somebody can make the first step and then it can be uh, like, like the, the Queen, she wasn't able to make the first step but by heaven she backed every other step that was made and by her prayer and she did pray that there would come peace because she that is one of the things she did say to me that she often prayed for the people of Northern Ireland and and indeed in her Christmas messages uh, the Queen would often s speak on these themes didn't she and yes. if, if, if anything increasingly in the last 20 years or so and that was you know people were hearing that from her and, and it was very important Yes, and I think the Queen had that great ability to grow and mature in, in her life, but even in her faith. I think, you know, the, the, the awful tragedy of Diane had, uh, Diana had a big effect on how the royalty, and especially the Queen, looked at life in a different way after that. And she could see that goodness was recognised. Well, the King's motorcade has been making its way through 
the streets of central Belfast, uh, I gather he is just a matter of uh, moments away from pulling up at the front of St. Anne's uh, Cathedral. Um, lots of people again gathered in Writer's Square, which is a large um, area, a large plaza mm. just opposite St. Anne's Cathedral. You can hear calls of God Save the King from members of the crowd. And I think he's just turning now into Donegal Street, um, arriving for what is his last formal engagement of the day on this visit to Northern Ireland. And that is a service of reflection for the life of his mother, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. And the King and Queen Consort just leaving the car. You can hear the cheers from the assembled crowd on the other side of the street. And again, Dame Fenilla J. O'Boyle, the Lieutenant of the County Borough of Belfast, greeting King Charles and Camilla. I've made the point before, Dame Fenilla is a friend of the King's. Also greeting uh, the Royal Couple, the Lord Mayor of Belfast, Christina Black, the High Sheriff of Belfast, Councillor John Hussey, and we can also see in that party the Chief Executive of Belfast City Council, John Walsh. And then again, interestingly, we've touched on it, the MP for North Belfast, in whose constituency the cathedral is, Sinn Féin's John Finucan. And again, the Bishop, Bishop Davison, uh, greeting the King. And presumably he will be involved in bringing him inside, shaking hands there, the Right Reverend George Davison, shaking hands with Queen Consort. A boisterous crowd, you might say. Yes, it's nice to see, see the welcome. Um, and I, th I think the other church leaders will be, and other faith leaders will be immediately inside the cathedral. So Her Majesty and the King, King Charles, entering Belfast Cathedral through the west doors and Seamus McKee is our commentator for the service of reflection. And uh, the Bishop of Connor introducing the King and the Queen Consort to faith leaders, Jewish, Chinese, Hindu, and Islamic. King Charles is understood to have requested that they be here. In his television address last Friday, the King said, wherever you may live in the United Kingdom, Whatever may be your backgrounds and beliefs, I shall endeavor to serve you with loyalty, respect, and love. Prayers were said for Queen Elizabeth in the Belfast Synagogue last Saturday. There'll be prayers in future for King Charles that he be granted the wisdom of Solomon, who looks down on this group from a magnificent stained glass window just above. Chinese community, represented by Danny Wong and Jimin Tomita of the Chinese Welfare Center. Dr. Satyavir Singhal is from the Indian Community Center in Belfast, and Dr. Salim Tareen and Mohammed Arshed are from the Islamic Center. There is no mistaking the significance of this moment. Charles, on his first visit to Belfast as king, recognizing and affirming the part played by these faith communities in this city and elsewhere in Northern Ireland. And now, the King and Queen Consort introduced to church leaders, all of whom will play a prominent part in this service, the Church of Ireland, Bishop of Armagh, John McDowell, and then the Catholic Archbishop Eamon Martin, the Presbyterian moderator, the Reverend John Kirkpatrick. Also being introduced is the Methodist President, the Reverend David Nixon, and the President of the Irish Council of Churches, the Reverend Andrew Foster, the Bishop of Derry and Raffo. And St. Anne's is unusual in serving two dioceses, Connor and Down and Dremore, whose Bishop David Maclay is also about to be introduced to the new monarch. And these introductions over trumpeters from the Royal Irish Regiment will sound a fanfare to signal the start of the service. They have their regimental chapel in this cathedral together with the Royal Irish Rangers. As Bishop Davison is explaining to the King and Queen Consort some of the features 
of this cathedral as they stand under this great west front dedicated in its entirety to entirety as a war memorial and indeed completed in 1927 just a year after the birth of Queen Elizabeth. As I say, the history of this cathedral spans the entire lifetime of Queen Elizabeth. And as the King and Queen Consort pause understandably for a moment um, in what has been a very busy day, and I suspect that the reception they got in Hillsborough which clearly delighted them and delighted the people, the many, many people with whom they shook hands, that that will have been uplifting for them. It's been an, ex an intense few days, and they make their way now to their places in this cathedral. This will be a Richmond fanfare composed by Sir Malcolm. <laughs> Now, as the king and the queen consort are accompanied to their seats, the choir sings the introit, George Dyson's Confortare. Be strong and of good courage, inspirational words and music that are a poignant reminder of the first time they were heard, Queen Elizabeth's coronation in 1953. Now, a triumphant hymn of joy, appropriate for a service of thanksgiving, all that dedicated city in exultant jubilation.
Brothers and sisters, we gather in this cathedral to commemorate in word and prayer Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, committing her to God during these days of national mourning, whilst celebrating her life and work for this country and for the Commonwealth and giving thanks for all that she has been as queen and as such head of state for the people of Northern Ireland. Within this act of worship, we shall pray for all those whose lives have been touched by Her Majesty, whether as a part of her family circle or more distantly, within the wide horizon of her concern. We mark with gratitude the dedication to duty that has exemplified her reign and give thanks for her presence under God as a pattern of all that is good and true in human life. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we commit to your loving care our Sovereign Lady Queen Elizabeth, who for 70 years has been to this land a wise, gracious, and dutiful monarch, committed to serving you on the pattern of your Son, Jesus our Lord. We give thanks for her faith, inspiration, and guidance through changing times and occasions of both national joy and public and private grief. Bless her family and all whose love and care have supported her throughout her long reign with comfort and strength in these days of loss and mourning. On King Charles, pour out, we beseech you, such an abundance of your grace that he may fulfill his calling with ever-increasing wisdom, discernment, and spiritual light. We gather our thoughts and prayers together in the words in which Christ taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now the first of two readings in the service of reflection and thanksgiving. The theme is a new beginning, and that for King Charles is rooted in a thousand years of monarchy and Christian faith. A king is being called to serve his people. And the reader, as is customary during services such as this, is being verged, as the expression is, led to the lectern where he will give this reading. The first in this service of thanksgiving. A reading from the book of Joshua, chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. When the entire nation of Israel had finished crossing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Select twelve men from the people, one from each tribe, and command them. Take twelve stones from here, out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priests' feet stood. Carry them over with you, 
and lay them down in the place where you camp tonight. The Israelites did as Joshua commanded. They took up 12 stones out of the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord told Joshua, carried them over with them to the place where they camped and laid down there. The people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. Those 12 stones, which they had taken out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal, saying to the Israelites, when your children ask their parents in time to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know. Israel crossed over the Jordan here on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you crossed over, as the Lord your God did for us when we crossed over the Red Sea. So that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, and so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. And now the psalm. It's a version by the Irish-born composer Charles Stanford. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, 
but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now, words and music written for King's College, Cambridge, by Sir Charles Wood, who was born in Armagh. Now, the act of commemoration. The Reverend Ruth Patterson is a Methodist minister. She lights a candle, and a period of silence will follow.
O Lord, our heavenly Father, high and mighty, King of kings and Lord of lords, the only ruler of princes, who from your throne beholds all who dwell upon earth, grant to us understanding of your will and thankfulness of heart for the life and reign of our most beloved Queen, and to her everlasting joy and felicity through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now the sermon will be given by the Most Reverend John McDowell, Church of Ireland, Archbishop of Armagh. Everybody in this cathedral will have their own image that comes to mind when the Queen's many visits here are talked about as they have been in recent days. Archbishop McDowell has spoken of the little gems of hope Queen Elizabeth provided to many peacemakers on this island of Ireland. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Nani Manahar, Agus Vic, Agus Esperadni. For many of us in the United Kingdom, there were two people whose deaths we could never imagine, our own and the Queen. And I think that is one of the reasons why the death of Queen Elizabeth was literally felt, felt so keenly by so many people when the news broke on Thursday afternoon. It was as though the nation's collective grief was gathered up in those remarkable words of Christopher Marlowe's. If I had wept a sea of tears for her, it would not ease the sorrow I sustain. And if that was how those of us felt who were in many ways part of her adopted family through her coronation oath, how much more profound must that feeling of loss be to those of the Queen's blood family, those who knew her best and loved her most. To Your Majesty, our prayers will be with you and your family for a long time to come. St Paul could be a bit of a gloomy old moralist at times, and some of his injunctions contained in his letters are very far from easy to fulfil. It's pretty difficult to have no anxiety about anything. But I would dare to suggest that for the family of the late Queen and for millions of others, there will be no difficulty whatsoever when she comes to mind in following St Paul's command to think on whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable whatever is worthy of praise. There were many other words used about the late Queen during her long reign. Faithfulness, care, dutifulness, love, devotion. And all of these could be employed to describe her relationship with Northern Ireland, and I have to say probably with patience, binding them all together. But paying attention especially to what she said most recently, the word which I think will be most associated with Queen Elizabeth and Ireland north and south is reconciliation. It's a great New Testament word. It's a great civic word. And it's a hard word. So hard in the religious sense that it was beyond the power of humanity to achieve, and God himself had to give it to us as a gift in his Son. And as a disciple of Jesus Christ, Queen Elizabeth followed where Jesus led, as women often have 
in the elusive and unfinished work of reconciliation here in Northern Ireland. For where the master is, there will the servant be also. It has always been love's way that in order to rise, she stoops. So bowing of the head in respect was far more powerful than much grander gestures would have been. Love listens far more than she speaks. So a few words in an unfamiliar tongue and a judicious sentence or two of heartfelt regret and wisdom said far more than ceaseless volubility. Love never rushes anything for fear of overwhelming the beloved. But when the moment was right, she walked the few steps between two houses of prayer in Enniskillen alongside the beloved in encouragement and affection. And although love is easily injured, she keeps no record of wrong and extends the open hand of sincerity and friendship with courage to create an environment and an atmosphere where reconciliation have a chance. Love never fails. Where the master is, there will the servant be also. Reconciliation is about the restoration of broken relationships. And the word should never be cheapened by pretending it's an easy thing to achieve. And by and large, in the work of reconciliation, most of our victories are achieved quietly and in private, and most of our humiliations will be in public. Reconciliation requires the greatest of all religious virtues, love, and it requires the greatest of all civic virtues, Courage. But as the great prophet, apostle of reconciliation says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace will be with you. And who can doubt that the Holy Spirit of the God of peace was present in the mind and in the heart of the late Queen when she spoke her judicious and generous words and walk the hard road of reconciliation in this province and on this island. The Queen's vocation as a Christian monarch to work for the good of all her people went far beyond the boundaries of these islands, but we have much to learn from it. That it is Christian to be tolerant, not because we believe so little about God, but because of the nature of the God we believe in, and because we believe so much in the importance of a free response to God's call. So firmly rooted in her Christian faith, the Queen was therefore firm in her belief that it is no part of a Christian's vocation to belittle another person's faith or lack of it. It's only an impression, but it did seem to me that in the last years of her reign, the tone and content of the Queen's broadcasts became slightly more overtly religious, and perhaps a little more personal. And on Christmas Day, only four or five years ago, she said this, although we are capable of great acts of kindness, history teaches us that we sometimes need saving from ourselves, from our recklessness and greed. So God sent into the world a unique person, neither a philosopher or a general, important as they are, but a saviour with the power to forgive. Forgiveness lies at the heart of the Christian faith. It can heal broken families, it can restore friendships, and it can reconcile divided communities. And she went on to say, and it is in forgiveness that we feel the power of God's love. At her baptism, Elizabeth Alexandra Mary was signed on her forehead with the sign of sacrifice, the cross. 
and for 96 years in a life which was a prodigy of steady endeavour, she offered herself, her soul and body as a living sacrifice to God who loves her with an everlasting love. So I want to finish by reminding us of those final words spoken by Mr. Valiant for Truth in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, some of which the Queen herself used in her very first television broadcast in 1957. Then he said, I am going to my father's, and though with great difficulty I am got hither, yet now do I not repent me of all the trouble I have been to arrive where I am. My sword I give to him who will succeed me in my pilgrimage, and my courage and skill to him that can get it. My marks and scars I carry with me that I have fought his battles, who will now be my rewarder. And when the day that he must go hence was come, many accompanied him to the riverside, into which as he went he said, Death, where is thy sting? As he went down deeper, he said, Grave, where is thy victory? And so he passed over, and the trumpets sounded for her on the other side. Now to the King of Ages, immortal, invisible, the only true God, be ascribed all might, majesty, dominion and power, as is most justly due. God save the King. Archbishop John McDowell speaking in that striking phrase of the Queen's vocation as a Christian monarch. And now the choir sing the anthem, luminous music, with words that are deeply personal for King Charles. They are all gone into the world of light, and I alone sit lingering here.
Let us pray. Gracious Father, hear our prayer for all whose lives have been an inspiration and example to others of devotion and faith. Most especially, we thank you today for the life and work of Queen Elizabeth. Receive her in your mercy into your nearer presence. Grant her your forgiveness. Perfect her in love. And may your light perpetual shine upon her. Grant that all that was true and honorable, compassionate and merciful in her life and witness to your Son, Jesus Christ, grow in the hearts of all who have shared her life here and look forward to a joyful reunion in the heavenly places. Through Christ our Lord, Amen. Generous Lord God, we give you thanks this day for the dedication to service and duty shown by the members of the royal family, following after the example set by Queen Elizabeth. At this time, May each draw strength from one another, from the long life of the Queen, and from their faith in God, that by personal example and the courage to serve, they may live for the well-being of this nation and for greater understanding in the world. In the name of the Prince of Peace, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God of all holiness and giver of life, protect and guide, we beseech you, all who seek in these days, through prayer, thought, and action, to fulfill their work in sustaining the life of this city and land. May all whose responsibilities bridge gulfs of understanding, of cultural or religious difference, or across divides of age, race, gender, or politics, come to know the central human need for love, security, justice, and peace. Maintain within all our institutions a unity of spirit which transcends difference, a oneness of purpose in mutual support for the good of all. This we pray in the spirit of he who bids us be one, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Lord God, whose power is infinite and love everlasting, grant to your servant Charles your merciful goodness. Bless and comfort him in his sorrow. Daily restore him in strength to meet the demands of his high calling. Fulfill in him your providential will, and may the indwelling spirit of your Son Jesus Christ, bring him peace of heart and courage to declare and do what is right. To his family, in your great compassion, shed your heavenly succor, and may they all know your presence daily as they turn their hearts to you and to your Son, who for us all is the bread of life and the gateway to heaven and in whose name we pray. Amen. 
The Reverend David Nixon's prayer for consolation and support, very much a theme in this service. Now a great Irish hymn, powerful words to a familiar air. This will be the first time God Save the King has been sung in St. Anne's Cathedral for 70 years.
stand at the last as if to affirm this congregation in its coming here to unite in sorrow, but also in praise and thanksgiving. The church leaders will give a shared Celtic blessing. The peace of the running wave to you. Deep peace of the flowing air to you. Deep peace of the quiet earth to you. Deep peace of the shining stars to you. Deep peace of the Son of Peace to you. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. And so ends this service of thanksgiving and reflection as the choir will begin to move towards the west door. This is the sound of Bach's magnificent St. Anne Prelude. The choir for this service is made up of the Priory Singers, supplemented by young singers from the Northern Ireland Opera Chorus program, conducted by Philip Bolton. The organist is Jack Wilson. He is from here, but is graduate organ scholar at Ely Cathedral. So what will people take away from this service? Well, it said one thing that comes very naturally to people here when they meet someone else who's been bereaved. Sorry for your loss, they say. Sometimes they don't know what more they can say. That was the point of the silent act of commemoration in the service. But we think of the words of the prayer read by the Methodist president, David Nixon, about King Charles. Bless and comfort him in his sorrow and his family in your great compassion. So there was condolence and support for someone who's suffered the loss of his mother, indeed both parents, in a relatively short space of time. There was Archbishop John McDowell's sermon with the King and the Queen Consort just a few feet away. And the Archbishop looking at Charles and addressing that loss directly. And you could see in the King's expression his response, his appreciation. There was also a striking phrase in that sermon. The Queen's vocation as a Christian monarch, the Archbishop was talking about her work for reconciliation. It was a sharp insight, wasn't it, into what motivated the Queen, a religious sense of duty. Not surprising in someone who was known to have regarded the anointing during her coronation as the pinnacle of the ceremony. Archbishop McDowell also pointed to the role of the Queen as a woman in what he called the elusive and unfinished work of reconciliation here in Ireland. Which brings to mind the words of former President Mary McAleese, who hosted the Queen on her state visit to Ireland in 2011. She said, let us hope the legacy in which the Queen invested so much will be honoured and realised. And there we can see pictures of King Charles shaking hands with and talking warmly to the President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins, and his wife, Sabina, and Camilla Queen Consort engaged in an animated conversation there with the President. And again, an embrace between Queen Consort 
and the president's wife. And the king and queen consort moving now through the nave to the great west doors of the cathedral and the king acknowledging the good wishes of members of the congregation. A service which was at one and the same time somber yet joyful, a sentence which was deliberately and very obviously multi-denominational. We had that multi-denominational blessing from the church leaders at the end. Two archbishops of Armagh taking part and a blessing from the Church of Ireland, Archbishop in Irish. And the King now talking to church leaders as he prepares to make his way down the steps. And he may, we think, speak to members of the public gathered in Writers Square just opposite the cathedral. The sun is shining and the king is still engaged in conversation with some of those church leaders, the archbishop there, uh, who conducted the service. Just bidding farewell to the king and queen consort. They're due to leave, of course, for London. They will travel to George Best, Belfast City Airport, where they'll board an aircraft for London. George Davidson just said his final farewells. And they've uh, come off the pavement onto the street. Their cars are there. They're making their way across to Ryder Square and just acknowledging the crowds. I'm in the studio with Gloria Honeyford, Brian Darcy and Lord Bew. We, we don't have a lot of time here in our coverage, but just very quickly, a sentence from each of you on, on what you've seen and the significance of it. Brian, first of all. Uh, the vocation, as a politics as a vocation, reconciliation, bringing people together, it's obvious in word and action, that's what we should be doing. Paul? For me, the, st the two lessons, one, one the young man, uh, connected very much to the Duke of Edinburgh award scheme and the other from Alex Maskey, who won't mind me saying he comes from a very traditional Irish Republican background. And the two of them together like that is very striking. Gloria. I thought it was a very poignant day. On one hand, we're still mourning the loss of the Queen. On the other hand, there was a lot of excitement and looking forward with the new King arriving in Northern Ireland for the first time. And I thought there was a lot of excitement, a lot of warmth, and I think the people of Hillsborough and Northern Ireland today were really, really thrilled with the whole visit. Well, I think it's fair to say after many years of civic pain and suffering, there is now peace, albeit a peace that came dropping slow, as the poet W.B. Yeats put it, a peace in which, as we've heard, the Queen herself played a not insignificant role. And that's really the theme of today, Brian. That's really the theme. That Her Majesty left as an example, and uh, she did her piece for the word. She has passed it on now to uh, King Charles and it's up to all of us to work and lead by the example that she has given. Work for peace and bring Ireland forward. Bring Northern Ireland to its proper place. Thank you all very much indeed for being with us today. As the King continues his walk about, our coverage of today's historic events in Northern Ireland draws to a close. Immediately following this programme on BBC One, Sophie Rayworth will continue our coverage as Her Majesty the Queen's coffin leaves St Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh and travels back to Buckingham Palace in London. There's been a great deal of talk today about grace and peacemaking and building on the legacy of what has gone before. We've been given much food for thought. It's certainly been a day the people of this place, in particular, are unlikely to forget for a very long time to come.